Good morning. In Korean, I hope I'm correct. Anyong Haseo to our colleagues in Seoul and hello to our colleagues from India. A very good morning and good afternoon, honorable presidents, distinguished fellows of both academies, eminent scientists, invited speakers, engineers, and researchers present at both Kolkata and Seoul. We are very happy to host the fifth INA. NAEK workshop on advanced materials for sustainable development in Kolkata, which is also known as the city of joy and is also the cultural capital of India. Kolkata is very special for its delicious food, particularly the delightful Bengali sweets. The local language spoken here, Bengali, is also known for its sweetness. INA President Professor Indranil Manna wanted this event to be in Kolkata and motivated us to design the event in a physical mode nearly a year ago. Accordingly, myself, Shanghu Mitra Bandopadhyay, and my colleague, Professor Debutosh Guho, started working as the coordinators and initially planned this event a little earlier in the physical mode. We were very optimistic, but the overall post-pandemic restrictions led us in conceiving this in a hybrid mode. We chose the topic of this workshop based on extensive deliberations between the two groups. In line with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, there is an urgent call for action for global partnership to not only improve our own lives, but to act in a manner that the generations to come can sustain the development, developments happening now. Hence, sustainability is the mantra of most of our efforts. Materials is an integral and pervasive part of all our activities. The target of advanced material design is to enhance properties of existing materials, as well as to develop new ones with desired properties. In India, there is another requirement to develop high quality materials at low cost, which will be accessible to a large population. We are, after all, a country poised to become the most populous country very soon. So the requirements and challenges of our two nations are quite distinct, and that is precisely why our collaboration is likely to succeed as we bring different perspectives to the table. The real challenge in organizing this event was getting a balanced group of experts as our invited speakers. We now have an amazing cluster of experts from academia, research institutions, and industries, <clears throat> thanks to the overall guidance of Professor Indranil Manna, untiring efforts of Professor Guho, and a little help here and there from me. I wish all of you an academically fulfilling two days of deliberations. Jiangmal Goma Woyo, and thank you very much. A few continuation from our side, from, from the coordinators, myself and Professor Shangamitra on the birthday. We are really happy to express our personal experience while contacting the keynote speakers and receiving their responses that took a long time to reach them, get feedback, again to reach other ones, get feedback. So it's a long story and that will take a long time. But we really enjoyed our interactions with them and very positive outcome. So thank you all speakers, our keynote speakers, for your wholehearted support and gracious participation today. Similarly, at the backstage, a few key people worked tremendously for the last few months. So their names are very important to mention in here. Lieutenant Colonel Shofit Rai from our academy, INAI, MS Pratik Galor from INAI, and Ms. Chanmin Lee from Korean side, NAK. It's really difficult to express 
their contributions, their efforts in, in words, but to sincerely acknowledge their untiring effort that uh, they gave in the last few months. <clears throat> happen. Although we are connected today through E cross H in our language of electromagnetics, that is the electromagnetic wave, but we are assembled in two cities in India and Korea. So thank you all in both cities, those who have assembled physically and taking trouble uh, for taking trouble for traveling all the way and sparing their time from their very busy schedule. If there are any inconveniences that have occurred, we are extremely sorry for that. But flaws are a part of a system. But at the, we believe at the end of this day, will be benefited and enriched in terms of knowledge, in terms of new scope of openings, of our joint research, future collaborations. So let's enjoy the workshop, enjoy your stay in Kolkata, and again, delicious food of Kolkata. Thank you. So with this award, it's my great privilege to invite President Aine, Indian National Academy of Engineering, Professor Indranil Manna. Professor Manna, please. Professor O Kyon Kwon, President NAEK. Professor Jung Hee Song, Vice President NAEK. Distinguished speakers, invitees, and fellows of Indian National Academy of Engineering, fellows and colleagues from our Korean counterpart, friends. A very good morning to all of you. Please allow me to wish you all a very fruitful interaction in this particular event organized as the fifth collaborative event between INAE and NAEK dedicated to the theme of advanced materials for sustainable development. You just heard about Calcutta, you heard about INAE, but let me offer my own reasons as to why I consider this event to be an extremely important exercise. Indian National Academy of Engineering, founded in 1987, in its 35th year, is one of the most vibrant professional peer group in the country, and the only one dedicated to the cause of engineering and technology in India. We draw our strength from three major quarters, namely the industry, academia, and R&D organizations. And we cater to literally from 18 to 80 years of age. In other words, we honor the most distinguished professionals in the country in engineering and technology through Lifetime Achievement Award. But we actually start our interaction with the community at a very young age when a youth is in the engineering college. So we offer various kinds of promotion, recognition, assessment, but our biggest task is to help the country, the government of India, in terms of policies and implementation of them concerning engineering and technology. We have uh, four major calendar activities throughout the year, namely the National Frontiers of Engineering, Youth Conclave, Engineers Conclave, and then finally the annual convention. But on the whole, Indian National Academy of Engineering is quite aware and committed to the fact that India is pursuing the path of development. And in the words of the Honorable Prime Minister, the goal of self-reliance or Atmanirbhar Bharat. And in this count, engineering and technology which is essentially the translation of fundamental knowledge into viable technology and products. 
we certainly need a peer body like INAE to steer the entire initiative of the country. I'm very happy to share with you that Indian National Academy of Engineering and its activities are not confined only within the shores of India. We do have collaborations with various international bodies, academies throughout the world. And the most important thing here today is I personally consider our collaboration with NAEK Korea is one of the most happening and vibrant one. This is the fifth occasion you just heard. And uh, the, uh, from the very beginning, we have concentrated on advanced materials. The first two occasions was on advanced materials. The first one was held in 2017 and in 2018, I had the privilege of leading the INE delegation to Korea that was held in Changwon. Subsequently, I also was fortunate to make a trip to uh, Postec, uh, the POSCO uh, Science and Technology University and Seoul National University. And since then, we have had uh, two more occasions of interaction. And despite the serious conditions prevailing during the pandemic, we still managed to continue with our interactions through online mechanism. And today, the so-called digital platform or virtual meetings are order of the day. But the new normal seems to be this hybrid model. So it's actually quite a concent concentrated effort. Uh, you just heard that in two days, we are going to have something like 16 presentations dedicated to specific themes related to this advanced materials for sustainable development. And these two themes are materials for quantum dot and machine learning for developing advanced materials. 16 chosen experts from our two countries are going to present the current status and the future scope of developments in these two very specific emerging areas. This is truly one of the highest form of knowledge growing by interaction. But I fervently hope that our efforts do not remain confined only to this two days deliberation. Let this deliberations actually facilitate future collaborations and possibly even some active research projects. The two countries certainly have very many things in common. Apart from the Independence Day, we also have quite a few common points dating back to our ancient culture and heritage. Let us move forward. I'm particularly thankful to my two colleagues uh, based in Calcutta, Professor Shangamitra Bandapadhyay, Director ISI Kolkata and Professor Devatash Guha for taking special initiatives to not only line up the best possible experts in these two themes, but also work tirelessly to make this entire event uh, absolutely uh, perfect. So from this uh, particular event, we look forward to having uh, exchange visits very soon. We hope this should res resume uh, in the near future. And uh, I personally was uh, extremely impressed with whatever little I could see during my visit to Korea in 2018. And as Shangamitra mentioned, that India with its, uh, uh, with its position today, not only with 1.3 plus billion people, but, and not only that we are going to be the most populous nation in the near future, but the most important thing is India also will be the youngest nation in the world very soon. Which means that if this country has one major resource to be proud of, that certainly is the demographic dividend. And we want to create this dividend to take it to a level whereby we are useful not only to our own country, but the entire humanity. With the prowess that I've seen in Korea, if we combine together, we certainly can offer something extremely extraordinary to the rest of the world. INE and NAEK should work together to that direction. So with these few words and optimistic note, 
I would end here thanking my counterparts in NAEK, the president, the vice president, and all the experts who are going to join this deliberation. And I look forward to having a much more fruitful interaction in the future. Thank you very much, Jai Hind. May I request Professor Jung Hee Song, Vice President NAEK, for the welcome address. Good morning, Kakata, and good afternoon in Korea. And I thank you very much, uh, you know, President Indranil Mena, for uh, you know succinctly uh, describe our very important uh, workshop today and tomorrow. And well, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, engineers from both countries to this fifth workshop between INE and NAIC. Despite numerous challenges caused by the pandemic, I'm delighted to continue strengthening our relationship through this annual workshop. On behalf of NAIC, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to NA for your efforts and dedication to make our collaboration fruitful. Especially, special thanks to Professor Andrinil Mena, President of NA, uh, for his strong support and leadership in our cooperation. Uh, since establishing a formal relationship uh, in 2011, the two academies have continued to develop mutual, mutual partnership. In particular, we had an in-depth exchange in materials science and aerospace engineering through the last four joint workshops. Continuing from the previous topics, this workshop will uh, expand on more and explore advanced materials as well as, as a convergence between uh, material science and ICT technologies. As mentioned in vision statement adopted, in, adopted at the Korea and India summit in uh, 2018, a strong com we are very strong complementary situation in science and technology. Combining Korea's strong manufacturing capability and India's excellent ICT and uh, fundamental R&D capability, I'm convinced to see that uh, we will see more uh, great synergy, in, uh, especially in material science and adjacent engineering topics. In this workshop, we would like to share uh, the current status and major issues of advanced materials research in Korea and India with a focus on quantum computing and machine learning. Through this, we seek to explore opportunities and strategies to strength, strengthen cooperative relationship between two countries in the future. I hope this workshop will serve as an excellent platform for active demonstration of our uh, you know, uh, co collaboration or uh, effort you know, geared for future collaboration between India and Korea. It, uh, last but not least, allow me thanks 16 uh, presenters and chairs for this workshop. I wish you all have a uh, wonderful and successful uh, workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for your nice presentation and talk. Uh, this is the time to start the technical session. We have two sessions for today. And today's theme is materials for quantum computing. The sessions, both sessions will be chaired by uh, Professor Shomit Kumar Ray. He's professor, Department of Physics, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. India, and uh, Dr. Seung Chiu Lee, Director of Indo-Korean Science and Technology Center, 
South Korea. So both session chairs will take care of the session. So may I invite Professor Ray to start the session. So good morning. So let me also welcome my co-chair, Professor Seung Chiu Lee from Korea. And as Professor Guho mentioned, today is the theme is the materials for quantum computing. So total, we have got eight lectures. So four in the morning and four in the post tea session. <clears throat> and from the Indian side, in fact, we are supposed to have all the speakers throughout these two days to be present in, in personal mode. But unfortunately, the first speaker, Dr. Omran Mukherjee, had to leave to Finland for some urgent work. So from, so from Indian side, it's almost is a physical mode uh, uh, workshop. OK, so let me start without any delay. And we'll request the speaker to take only 15 minutes and leave five minutes for question and answer and discussions between the two countries. Uh, and the first speaker is Dr. Omran Mukherjee. He comes from an industry. In fact, he's a senior director, quantum technology, QPI AI India Limited. In fact, this is the first company in India uh, on the quantum technology. And uh, Dr. Mukherjee has got wide experience of more than 12 years in the experience in the quantum technology and quantum hard hardware. So we are really waiting for the exciting talk from Dr. Mukherjee. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for this introduction. Let me begin by sharing the screen. I hope I am audible. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me once again begin by uh, apology that I couldn't uh, attend physically in Kolkata. I'm right now in Helsinki. And uh, I also have a disclaimer to make. Uh, uh, though it's the first talk in the technical session, I would be attempting to present uh, an overview of quantum computing, uh, uh, but in a pseudo technical manner, uh, not going to further details. So in the interest of time, let me just go through. OK, I am from uh, this Indian startup called QPi AI. We, uh, we have ambitions to build quantum computers in India for the world where we have uh, both full stack uh, software and full stack hardware. So more about it at the end of the talk. So uh, just uh, going ahead, uh, the agenda for today is I will try to introduce what is quantum, why go quantum, and how to go quantum. Uh, so however, I think everybody knows about it. Uh, so what is quantum? The nature itself, we, we live in quantum. Essentially, uh, we have discrete states. Uh, and if you want to simulate uh, nature, would we'd have to go in the quantum way in the words of uh, nature, uh, Richard Feynman. Nature isn't uh, classical. So we have to really, really need a quantum computer to simulate nature. So uh, in, in a very simple, naive way, uh, how it is different from a classical computer. Uh, a classical computer works with bits, 0 and 1, uh, while quantum computer, on the other hand, uh, rely on qubits. Essentially, they can be in a, a superposition state of a zero and one. And but we must not forget there are other superpowers that comes with quantum computers. So for example, quantum confinement, uh, entanglement, and uh, quantum interference, for which uh, we have no classical analog to explain. So, uh, but uh, we talk about it a lot. But what is the quantum advantage? So let me take one example. Let's say Grover's algorithm. Uh, which essentially gives us uh, uh, the best algorithm to do search over unstructured data. An example I would like to pre present over here is a needle in a haystack. So if I want to find the needle in a haystack, in a classical mode, what one would do would take a looking glass and, uh, and then try to look uh, for, for, for the needle. And that would take a long time essentially searching each element through this haystack and trying to distinguish it between uh, needle and the haystack. However, if we ask nature to solve this problem, probably nature will say, okay, just put the entire needle and the haystack uh, and put it in water. So what will happen is the haystack will, the hay will just float on the water while the needle will sink to the bottom of the water. And therefore uh, we'll able to find the needle. Also, we can put a magnet, for example, and accelerate this process. This is uh, not exactly quantum computing, but quite analogous to what we are trying to say over here. Whether we begin with a superposition state, 
let's say uh, this needle and haystack are in you know on a combination of it so and then we do our uh, quantum computing overhead uh, and then essentially we uh, end up with just two states uh, separating the state that we wanted to uh, actually observe so and therefore we are able to uh, resolve this problem so such a parallel uh, computing is uh, is advantageous in many aspects uh, for example, uh, you know, logistics, fin uh, finance optimization, but more importantly, perhaps for this session is uh, this, uh, in fact, the highest value uh, business proposition that can come out from, in my opinion, uh, of, of this quantum computing is in, the, in, the, in terms of material discovery. For example, uh, chemistry or drug. Uh, again, uh, for example, if you want to really, uh, really invent uh, if I say so, an an uh, antibiotic, then uh, what one does today is essentially discover antibiotic rather than invent it. So uh, the hope is using quantum computers, one can actually do a proper ab initio calculation really from the beginning and try to get out, uh, get the structure out of it and uh, say that, okay, if you build this particular antibiotic, it will be much more efficient than others. Uh, so that is our target certain uh, bacteria very efficiently. So uh, one of the things that I want to highlight over here is that we are currently in the number of qubits quite below the classical, uh, you know, what we can achieve classically. So as we, as, we, as, a, as we go ahead in the future, we have to actually increase the number of qubits. So uh, one of the main theme of this uh, presentation is uh, scalability, which is uh, the main roadblock that I see in terms of uh, achieving the quantum supremacy, where when I say uh, the quantum would be much more advantageous and even uh, in, a, in also in a business sense that one does it uh, uh, better than the classical computing in all these aspects. Okay, why are we are going quantum now than ever? First of all, uh, because the classical processing is actually, uh, uh, you know, reaching its limit. The, you know, uh, the number of transistors that you can put it in a chip, for example, is getting plateaued, as you can see over here. Uh, this is already quite old, but however, that is uh, being continued. So the Moore's law, uh, unfortunately, is not working uh, now. So then uh, the idea, the question that everybody is asking, can quantum computing come to the rescue of such an, uh, you know, uh, saturation? And in the very near term, uh, I would say the quantum computing will affect, uh, you know, the artificial intelligence and machine learning, material discovery, cybersecurity, optimization. So, and the experts tell me that uh, the total available market will grow uh, with a rate of 50% or so to about $65 billion dollar by 2030 and uh, so and, uh, i cannot uh, but uh, you know mention uh, the google supremacy uh, uh, news that came in 2019 where google announced that they are actually able to uh, perform uh, quantum or calculations that uh, essentially uh, is impossible practically impossible for a uh, classical machine to replicate so, and uh, with that, uh, still the race is on, and uh, I believe IBM has already uh, 127 qubits. This is good enough, but good, but not enough in a sense that uh, you know we need really, really, if not 500 thousands uh, of uh, logical qubit to actually get some advantage that in a practical sense out of these machines. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one should on, also look at uh, quantum computing, just not from the quantum, quantum, uh, quantum computing part. There's another aspect of uh, quantum secured communication. Toshiba has uh, very recently launched uh, their uh, commercial trial of a quantum network, uh, and uh, that is also a very good sign. So uh, and who is going quantum? Uh, essentially, everybody. Uh, so, as we see on this, uh, this is only uh, what is available publicly and uh, from, from the government. So, India, for example, has a, a national quantum mission, which amounts to about $1 billion over five years uh, to be spent on various quantum technologies. Europe, uh, they have their own European Union flagship, about $1 billion. 
uh, Germany has their own separate uh, program apart from Europe and US and China is always uh, you know uh, is really really heavily invested in quantum computing they this is the number uh, uh, 10 billion dollar it's an undisclosed amount uh, so this is an estimation uh, Korea I don't know uh, maybe uh, our uh, esteemed uh, colleagues will tell me um, uh, this thing, uh, what I, we are able to gather it is 35, uh, $37 million uh, from the government, but I hope this is a old uh, figure. Okay, now coming to uh, really to build one. So how do we build a quantum computer? So the requirement is a minimal uh, two level system and it should uh, be quite, uh, you know, they should have nice properties in terms of entanglement and uh, so position and we should have a good control and a readout. So that is what we have. And uh, what it's nice to have is a high temperature operation as we see that most of these systems actually need quite a deep cooling, meaning they're all cryogenic uh, cool systems. So what are those qubits? So of course uh, we have, once again, the two level system, the requirement is again, control and readout of such two level systems and also uh, entanglement. And actually the main uh, challenges that we face right now is scaling of such qubits and position control and gating of such systems. So we have really a lot uh, of uh, qubits available to choose from if you want to see and get an overview of it. So starting from superconducting qubits, we have uh, various companies who are actually uh, are really actively working on it. IBM, Regati, Google, uh, Alibaba, uh, spin qubits, which are uh, quantum mechanics confined electrons uh, and uh, they've been controlled with the microwave. So this uh, kind of approach has been taken by Intel, uh, uh, us, UPI AI, and uh, many others also. I have not mentioned it over here. And then there is uh, this group uh, is there, which is in solid state. We also have something which is not solid state, uh, which is like you, you, you just use the atoms, for example, iron trap, a nuclear atom, or even go photonic in that case. Uh, the main uh, advantage of this case, of these kind of uh, other uh, quantum systems, the claim is to they, they operate at room temperature. However, if you look closely to these systems, they either require a bulky setup and a very uh, high precision of uh, measurement techniques like uh, photon counting, uh, which essentially operates using superconducting uh, uh, photon detectors, and I would uh, claim that almost everything ultimately would require uh, uh, low temperature operation. Control, Recording in progress. The microwave coming up and the time dependent magnetic field will actually flip the spin. We also have a, 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 a magnetic field uh, which is defined the Zeeman splitting in the system. To read out such a system, one can use uh, what is known as a quantum point contact. The current through this uh, really narrow channel will be affected by presence and absence of electron, and therefore we'll be able to do. Uh, uh, the spin detection, in fact, uh, the, the, when we do spin to charge conversion. Okay, more a little bit more about the quantum control. Uh, so the quantum control part looks like uh, an arbitrary wave generator, uh, which is uh, being multiplied with a local oscillator, essentially a microwave source. And then this is fed to an ESR line. The idea over here is that you can control uh, the shape of this uh, pulse to make a uh, phase or amplitude uh, modulation of the qubit. Yeah. Are we, hello? Are we out of time? One minute more for you. Okay. Uh, so let me very quick. So the spin readout could be also done in various. Okay. So uh, the idea over here is that all this thing is fine and there has been many approaches to make such a thing. However, the most important part over here is the 
the material itself, uh, we are talking about, let's say, silicon 28, an acetopically purified uh, uh, material, that is essential for having long coherence time. So we need a material uh, research in this uh, thing to have spin-free systems. Uh, also, now about my company, uh, the company that I'm working with, so we are having a full stack solution, already, the software is already there. And uh, to solve the, the, the wiring problem that we usually uh, get for scaling, uh, we are going for cryogenic electronics. We are building you know, uh, a cryogenic electronic stack where we have is this essentially like a 5G mobile phone transceiver where we feed in the local oscillator and this can do uh, mal, you know, muxing and therefore it can talk to qubits over here. So this system actually uh, stays in 4K, 4 Kelvin electronic system while the uh, quantum bits will be at millikelvin temperature. So that's a very quick overview. We also are coming up with our own uh, uh, test bed very soon of 25 qubits where both superconducting and semiconducting qubits could be tested. So that's all. For my side, we should uh, look beyond the height now. We are at the peak of it. Uh, I believe uh, though the systems are already there, uh, there still has to be enough uh, scaling to prove and material advances to have a real quantum computer working. And thank you very much. Uh, that, that would be it. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee, for a nice overview of the technology, quantum technology. So uh, now, of course, this, uh, the lecture is open for questions. So we have got, at least we can take three, four questions. So anyone? <coughs> can I have a question. Yes, yes. please go ahead. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, my quick question is uh, that you emphasize the importance of uh, Silicon 28, and uh, I totally agree with you. My question is uh, currently, how do you manage to uh, get those material? Uh, do you grow yourself or get from other, other uh, places? Uh, Professor Kim, yes, uh, I totally uh, agree with you. I, I totally uh, agree with the point that you're hinting at. Yes, uh, that's what I was trying to tell you that or everybody else that we need to uh, come up with the sources because what we have right now is a very limited source of uh, uh, remain, remaining of the Avogadro project, right? So uh, we don't have, in fact, uh, I would say in India. So currently we are not working on 28 uh, silicon. We are going for the, through the commercially available CMOS route, and uh, you know we try to prove that uh, this, you know we we know that the spin uh, uh, you know the coherence will be very fast in the such systems, but we want to prove the scalability in that system already, so that we can convince you know everybody in countries or even foundries to get on to this uh, quantum mission to have silicon 28 available quite ubiquitously. Thank you. Yeah, please, Mr. Paul. Yes, uh, but very faintly. So, Dr. Mukherjee, uh, uh, very interesting talk. But uh, one confusion, uh, if you can kindly clarify, you said for this single photon counting, you need, uh, uh, you know, a superconducting detector. So, my point is that if you use the MCP PMT like a micro channel plate in your heterodyning mode, you can do. You can uh, find uh, single photon counting stuff with the TTS of 23 uh, picosecond. So why not uh, a simple room temperature? Why we need to go uh, superconducting one? Can you clarify? True, true, true. Very good point. Uh, the thing is uh, also in terms of efficiency in detection of photons. So if you look at uh, superconducting detectors, they have uh, quite very nice, uh, you know, uh, detection efficiency. They go uh, to in the regime of um, easily to 93, 95, and sometime even 99. Uh, and they are, uh, you know, in a sense that uh, the scaling, they are small. They could be, for example, integrated with uh, silicon photonics. That is, has been a challenge right now. So for example, Psy Quantum, uh, the company which is trying to do all, uh, uh, you know, source uh, manipulation and detection in a single chip. So uh, that is uh, the idea over here. And because, you know, if you think about it, it uh, the PMTs are quite uh, bulky. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
Sorry, I can't hear you now. If you're asking question, I can't hear you now. Chairman uh, is asking. Uh, I think probably we'll close the talk here because of lack of time. Okay. So obviously is available. No, no, no sir. Email. One thing that quantum efficiency and the gain, uh, uh, whatever uh, Dr. Mukherjee said, uh, can be achieved with this. Maybe I'll discuss That's later. That's good. I think we should sure. discuss. Uh, electronic. Thank you for your comment. So uh, thank, thank you, you Dr. Much. Mukherjee, for a wonderful lecture. Now from the uh, Indian organization side, I have the pleasure to present your memento, which will be taken by Professor Devotosh Go on your behalf. <laughs> and it will be mailed to you. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Professor Sa Lai. And, and my name is Sung Chul Lee from Korea side. And thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. And now let's move on to the next presentation. The first speaker from Korea will be Professor Dohan Kim, Department of Physics and Astronomy, Seoul National University. Professor Kim will deliver a speech about recent advances in semiconductor quantum dot based quantum computing. While listening to you, his talk, please feel free to leave your comments or questions on YouTube chat during the speech. I will choose and read the question after his presentation. Now, please welcome Professor Kim. Thank you. Uh, let me first thank the organizers for uh, inviting me here and giving an opportunity to give a presentation. I assume that you can see my slides uh, well. Uh, okay. The, the picture you are seeing right now is a sample module uh, that goes into the cryostat uh, that contains a few qubits that is uh, made by semiconductor chip. And I realized that uh, my, my talk will be a natural extension or, you know, uh, will go along with the previous uh, talk, uh, talking about uh, semiconductor quantum dot based spin qubits and one way to make a, a quantum computer. I will go through these time, uh, kind of steps. I will first uh, explain why semiconductor quantum dust spin qubits. And uh, as a main body, I will take some time to talk about the current status, uh, in particular in Korea, uh, how we make uh, spin qubits in Korea, and uh, the vision or some outlook that I think uh, that the uh, path forward that we should take to make a scalable quantum computer using semiconductor chips. So uh, as a previous speaker mentioned, uh, there is a global effort to make a, a large scale quantum computer having uh, lots of qubits. And there are many uh, companies uh, they are taking e effort to and the main component of the um, quantum computer is qubits, but I'd like to emphasize that because qubit is not only just a fluctuating bit called a p-bit, but also have a phase coherence, uh, which, can, which is essential to make a quantum superposition of uh, zero and, and one. And because of this uh, you know, uh, constraint to keep the coherence, uh, making a quantum computer is uh, tremendously hard. Uh, let me first um, compare uh, making quantum computer to making a classical computer. In classical computing, um, there is a main theme, uh, making transistors smaller and smaller, because uh, making transistors smaller uh, makes um, almost every uh, performance better and better. So. The effect is, uh, I will call, a uh, synergy. On the other hand, uh, making quantum computer is very hard because uh, the task that you should do to make a quantum computer is, uh, in principle, conflicting. So that's a, a fundamental reason why uh, quantum, making quantum computer is very hard. So uh, keeping uh, phase coherence can be done in various uh, platforms. Uh, this is similar to the picture uh, from the previous uh, speaker, but I will uh, just focus on uh, one uh, type of platform that is called a semiconductor quantum dots and the importance of this platform. So schematically, it looks like this. It, is, it looks very similar to the uh, traditional uh, transistor that is nowadays used. We start from uh, high quality material 
we use a nanofabricated gate electrode to confine some electron as an array. We call it a spin qubit array. And main noise sources are coming from uh, the material itself. And we use a nearby uh, quantum dot, another quantum dot, to, to act as an uh, electrometer to uh, read out the state of this, these qubits. So why semiconductor quantum dot based quantum computing? It is well known that the spin degree of freedom in semiconductor, even though it is in this condensed matter system that typically has uh, lots of interaction, has very long coherence time. And compared to other platforms in semiconductor quantum dots, a single shot measurement scheme is well known and easily can be easily prepared. And also, I'd like to point out that because we only use gate voltages to define our qubit, everything is tunable. Um, so that tunability adds to the one advantage of uh, any kind of qubits. Uh, needless to mention uh, that the semiconductor chips are uh, just uh, can be made by a foundry uh, processes. So that is very compatible with uh, existing technology. So uh, the main materials for these uh, spin qubits are uh, either 3-5 uh, material, uh, and most popular one nowadays is silicon, natural silicon, or isotopically purified silicon, because uh, in, in these materials, uh, both the nuclear spin that can act as a noise sources or a spin of a coupling is very, very small, so the coherence time is very uh, long. And there's also uh, emerging uh, material, germanium. Uh, in this material, we use holes instead of electron spin uh, because of this uh, capability or possibility to electrically uh, manipulate these uh, spin states uh, via spin of a coupling. And I think uh, more on the spin of a coupling will be delivered by uh, later talks. So this is uh, a one chart showing uh, the number of qubits, controllable qubits uh, in spin qubit uh, research field. It all started with the gallium arsenide demonstration, but nowadays with the development of spin qubits in silicon and germanium, uh, just a few qubit demonstration has been performed. And of course, uh, it is, uh, you know, much, much um, lower a number of qubits, a uh, small number of qubits compared to other leading platforms, but I would say the rate of development is uh, very rapid. You can see the now Intel or semiconductor uh, companies are trying to make a spin qubits out of uh, their uh, foundry processes. So uh, I would say that uh, these spin qubits have uh, lots of potential in terms of uh, spin scalability. And the current state of art is about just a few qubit manipulations. You can see that recently uh, researchers in uh, Delft uh, reported uh, full six qubit um, manipulation and control in these semiconductor chips. And um, for amusement, I, I draw, I, I mean, I, I stole these pictures from the paper of all the spin qubit uh, paper, and also the superconducting paper. You can see the pulse sequence uh, looks very similar. And, and it is very amusing that uh, although the platform is very different, the control mechanism or control scheme is very similar uh, in shared in between uh, all platforms in a solid state based uh, qubit. Also in germanium, uh, four qubit entanglement has been demonstrated. So, so far, a few qubit demonstration and qubit, few, few qubit uh, entanglement have been demonstrated. So this is the world state of uh, the art in, uh, in terms of number of qubits or uh, entanglement quality. So I'd like to move on to then, what about the Korea? Uh, recently, uh, Korea has in, uh, initiated a program to make a, a scalable or programmable few qubit uh, quantum uh, computing devices in uh, semiconductor chips. 
uh, we made a team uh, composed of six PI uh, with uh, the main PI myself, and also including the material provider from Japan who can provide uh, isotopically uh, engineered um, silicon 28. Uh, we have set up uh, these uh, dilution bridges for a uh, spin qubit project. And for, in terms of controllability and the instrumentation, we have already set up uh, two of the uh, dilution bridges, which has a, a very good performance and also uh, you know, control of, uh, lots of controllability, which is also expandable. And one uh, contribution we have shown recently is very high fidelity or uh, measurement fidelity and initialization fidelity. It is still in gallium arsenide uh, spin qubit, so the coherence time is not that long, but we have achieved uh, you know, one of the best uh, visibility of qubit operation. So we have some, uh, already have some contribution uh, that has a possibility uh, to uh, lead into the, the leading <coughs> groups uh, very quickly. Also, we are uh, make, uh, trying very hard to make uh, spin qubits in silicon. Um, and luckily, we have contacted uh, you know, uh, Delft University, the, the very same uh, groups that has uh, state-of-the-art uh, materials and also controllability. And they uh, kindly provided us a uh, silicon 208 uh, wafer. And so we have uh, recently uh, fabricated this five qubit silicon 28 devices with two charge detectors. And we are trying to quickly uh, catch up uh, world-class uh, spin qubit. So uh, I'd like to um, spend a few more uh, minutes to talk about you know, what's next. Uh, currently, um, we have seen a few qubit operations and uh, soon enough, in a few years, uh, I think uh, we will see uh, tens of qubit manipulation in also in, uh, not only in a, a superconducting qubits, but also in a semiconductor qubits. But in order to move forward to make, uh, you know, really lots of uh, qubits, uh, the current setup, like, uh, you know, room temperature electronics and low temperature qubits and many, many connecting lines is not the solution, obviously. And and someday we need to make a so-called quantum uh, system on chip where uh, all the uh, functionality like uh, qubit layers, control electronics, readout electronics are integrated in one chip should be realized. And there, there are already many proposals and uh, designs to make this uh, uh, you know, uh, memory like uh, DRAM uh, Look, looking, looking like uh, designs or micromagnet techniques. But um, frankly, it has not been realized yet. Uh, there are only uh, designs so far. Uh, Intel, are, Intel is uh, making a very hard effort to make a, a very efficient cryogenic controller. Uh, as I said, in order to make a quantum SOC, uh, we need to make a classical controlling circuit that can operate at cryogenic temperature. Recently, they have uh, announced a, a model uh, called Hot Host Reach, which can uh, both read out and um, uh, produce these uh, pulse pulses for qubit manipulation in one chip. But uh, uh, so far, uh, there is uh, a qubit is still in millikelvin temperature, whereas you know these cryogenic electronics are still at a few kelvin temperature. So there are still you know a requirement for the many many connections, uh, connecting qubit and controlling circuits. So obviously uh, in the you know real quantum SOC, these two should be you know integrated in one chip. But there is a one problem. I mean, uh, traditionally spin qubit, all the spin qubit experiments has been done in millikelvin temperature where lowest temperature that cryo controller can uh, go down is about a few Kelvin because of the cooling power uh, <clears throat> requirement. 
because these classical con controllers uh, should uh, emit uh, lots of heat, uh, there is no way to maintain these millikelvin temperature where these uh, controller uh, produces heat. So the only way uh, in this scheme uh, is to make a spin qubit that can operate, you know, a little bit higher temperature than millikelvin. And people have uh, uh, researched uh, recently and they have nicely shown that uh, in spin qubit, although uh, all the spin qubit traditionally has been done at uh, millikelvin temperature, these coherences can be maintained at few Kelvin temperature, like uh, 1.5 Kelvin shown here for spin qubit. And uh, more recently in CMOS fabricated whole spin qubit in silicon, it has been demonstrated, um, of course, you know, coherence time gets uh, lower and lower as we raise up the temperature, but a few Kelvin, uh, at, even at few Kelvin, uh, the coherence can be maintained. So um, I would say the path forward in this research area is how to make uh, you know, qubit operating at higher temperature and how think, uh, thinking about how to uh, integrate all the components in one chip making a quantum SOC to really realize um, a scalable quantum computer. So let me stop here and I'll be happy to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. And is there any question or comments from Indian side or Korean side? Please let me know. There's one question. Yes. And Hi, Dr. Uh, McBride, yes. Yes, you, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim, for a nice talk. Yeah, uh, you are absolutely right about this uh, uh, control electronics. This is the first mm -hmm. thing we are trying to develop. But I have a question on uh, the other side. So there has been recently the proposals of using global field or uh, you can see continuous drive of spin qubits to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, get into a, uh, perhaps a decoherence free uh, space. <clears throat> To do quantum manipulation, right? When you continuously drive uh, such uh, qubits together, what are your th thoughts about it? Say, let's say you have a natural uh, silicon uh, and you are using uh, continuous drive. So, mm -hmm. is it good enough to compensate for the, the uh, you know the spin background? I see. I see. So, um, <clears throat> my quick answer is that I also see a good potential even for natural silicon. And uh, frankly speaking, I am not aware of this global field or continuous driving uh, techniques. But uh, the way I see is that uh, uh, the recent, in recent reports, even in natural silicon, when you use a whole spin qubit, because it has a large anisotropy, by adjusting the direction of magnetic field, uh, recent reports uh, report that uh, even the natural silicon can host whole spin qubit that can have a coherence time T2 star larger than uh, 20 microseconds. So um, I would say, you know, we, there is a room, a lot of room uh, or potential even for natural silicon. Thank you, Professor Kim. Thanks for the reassurance. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. And is there any other questions or comments? I had a brief uh, question, but that has almost been answered already. Uh, but mm -hmm. what is the coherence time that is required for the, this, uh, this quantum computing to be practical, particularly for the skin, skin pubits? What do you think? Uh, I see. So nowadays we are, uh, everyone is talking about, you know, uh, error correction threshold. Uh, it depends on the error correction code but generally accepted value is a 99 point something uh, fidelity. In order to get that fidelity in spin qubit, which, which uh, actually has been demonstrated recently, uh, people are talking about T2 star about just a few microseconds. Oh, because uh, spin qubit can be manipulated very fast. Uh, even with a few microsecond coherence time, um, <clears throat> uh, fidelity of, uh, over 99% can, can be achieved. And I'm talking about T2. Uh, T1 is not a problem. 
in spin qubits uh, because it is uh, always very long. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor Kim. And uh, now it is time is up, and I'm handing over my chairmanship to the Indian side. Thank you. So the next speaker from the Indian side is uh, Professor Bhaskar Mulidharan from Department of Electrical Engineering, IIT Bombay. I think you'll be talking about engineering spin orbit interactions in qubit technologies. Professor Mulidharan, please. Um, good morning. First of all, thank you very much for giving me a chance to speak in this workshop. I'm honored to be invited. Second is, uh, I apologize for the font issue because it was made in a Mac and somehow it doesn't translate well into the Windows. So with this, uh, let me start. Um, so I am a theorist working at the intersection of devices and materials. So it's, uh, I'm happy that I've been invited to share my privilege. This is my research group in IIT Bombay. It's the computational nanoelectronics group. I, I think the screen needs to be made proper. Um, can you kindly make it full screen? Okay, thank you. So why is this screen being cut off? Hmm? Just a minute. Can I just bring my laptop? Well, I can see well. So in online, you can see the top screen, the title. Yeah. And the bottom. OK. All right. So uh, what we work on is basically currents at the nanoscale. And this is why uh, we can bring in an extra perspective of what I'm doing. So it all started because we work on Beyond Moore. And the idea is after scaling, what next? And then there is this whole Beyond Moore technologies. And there's a whole zoom, zoom of materials and technologies that are currently being investigated. And so some of the things we are looking at is obviously quantum slash neuromorphic. And eventually, quantum materials and devices will form at the forefront of these types of ideas. Let me reiterate, I'm a theorist, and I work on current flow at the nanoscale. And so let me explain you briefly what it is. Any device consists is basically an amalgam of material science as well as device physics. So for example, the simplest device, in fact, all quantum devices will be built on the same framework. That includes a conducting area. That includes a source and drain electrodes. And then, of course, the gating. So the, the channel is typically what we com what comprises the material science aspect. Then comes the contacts, which is basically the ones that give and flow the electrons. And then we do have the interface physics. And then finally, we do have the inflow outflow dynamics that really governs the current flow, which is kind of very similar to, you know, how a water flows through two reservoirs. Now this is what will be used typically, and the gate is something that turns on and off the current flow. Now, with these theoretical minimum basics, we can actually go into a lot of complicated device frameworks, which I'll be discussing today. One important thing is a voltage is applied to you know, drive the currents in between the energy levels that are available between the source and drain. Now, this same concept will be extended even to how we detect qubit states and all those things, which I'll explain now. So some of the things we have really worked on in the past few years include spintronics, includes 2D materials and devices, as well as topological quantum hybrid systems, that is the Majorana fermions and things like that. 
So coming to spintronic information processing, you know, spins can be used, you know, as apart from, um, of course, charge was the main bit till the entire 20th century, but spins can be used in three forms. One is the stable case, which is the magnets, and then comes the unstable, which is the P bits, as someone else, as the previous speaker mentioned, that is a fluctuating up and down spins. And then at low temperature is that delicate superpositions of zeros and ones that forms the qubit. So this is the standard technology people are looking at in the CMOS and magnets, that is the spin torque memories. But here is the entire set of things people are looking at at the solid state, which is the qubit platform. Now, the qubit itself involves various things. That is basically a superposition of the classical bit, 0 and 1, which is in the form of spins. The whole field of spin-based qubits started with this lost dimensions of uh, uh, paradigm, which is about controlling spins. And then we'll be talking about two types of solid state qubits, that is the quantum dot based and the 2D based, material space. And then I will go into the topological qubits a bit in the end, which is also depending on the spin orbit coupling. So what is interesting is that what we're talking about really involves engineering the coupling of orbital and the spin degrees of freedom can not only lead to better paradigms in normal quantum computing, but also in this topological quantum computing, which is a new type of ideas, which has been pursued in Microsoft. So let me explain that it not only comprises the materials, which is silicon, gallium arsenide, and other things, but also indium arsenide, 2D materials, as well as forming device structures that are very crucial, which finally involve gate, source, drain, et cetera. Okay, so let's start about spin-orbit interaction. Spin-orbit interaction comes in, in when spin degrees get coupled with the momentum degrees, et cetera. And most of these structures are confined structures, and especially in silicon, gallium, arsenide, et cetera. And so when you confine the electrons, you get this electric, local electric fields that can create this spin-orbit coupling. Now, the spin-orbit coupling is basically something that creates a pseudo-magnetic field which really helps in the manipulation. Now, it also occurs in various structures in 2D, apart from the strange structures that people talk about in you know, quantum wells and things like that. It also is a very important player for your Majorana because it involves spin-orbit coupled nanowire device, which is basically the key player of getting these Majorana qubits. So let's talk about these in the talk. So first I will talk about you know, basics of qubit manipulation and the types of qubits. And then I will talk about a bit of the valley qubits and 2D materials, and then of course the topological qubits. So there are two types of spin orbit coupling that really matter here. One is the Dressel house and the other is the Rashpa. And Rashpa is something that will be used in either of these cases. So these are the two references that, I don't know, it's not visible here that I have really considered. One is a review which is going to come in RMP called Semiconductor Spin Qubits, and the other is New Perspectives on Rashpa. So let me start that there are these four types of qubits that are considered in solid state silicon. One is the first proposal, and the early qubits were single qubits in you know, gate-confined silicon structures, and modern devices have the fin-fed technology. There are donor qubits that I won't talk about much, and then there are the singlet triplet, which is an extension of the single qubit, but in a double quantum dot framework, and then there is a more complex one called the exchange only qubits. So in the silicon platform, we have single qubits, multiple qubits, et cetera, and exchange qubits. So one of the most important thing is in a double qubit, which many people are working on, is the singlet triplet qubit, where you put gate voltages at the two you know, dots, as well as you have a tunnel coupling, and you can engineer what is called Pauli spin blockade, where the electron can sit, you know, when there is, you know, there is a spin selection rule that makes sure that the electrons don't carry a current, and then when you shift it to the other side, the current flows. So with that conductance measurement, you can sense whether the state is a singlet or a triplet. So, so this is a typical set of qubits here, and these are the energy level not visible here again, but you have a standard qubit, which is only the two energy levels, and then you have, you know, singlet triplet, which is basically four levels, and the qubit is formed between the singlet and the zero triplet. And then you, of course, have the exchange-only qubit with further 
many more states. Now, what is interesting is any standard operation involves initialization, manipulation, and then finally, read out, right? So typically, initialization involves taking it to a state and then you know making the spin reside there. And then the manipulation really consists of spin rotation. And then the readout is something where electron ejects or doesn't eject out of the contact. Thereby, you measure a current or you don't measure a current. So based on this, this is the standard way to control qubits. One is a local control. Then the other one is the control of multiple qubits through the exchange interaction. So based on that, the double spin qubits are really, the double quantum dots qubits are really going up, which is basically, and spin orbit interaction is going to be very important. So one of the most important thing is in a double qubit, you can initialize a qubit in the zero two state, where there's zero or two, or then there is a one one state, and then you play around between these states to get the readout and manipulation. So spin orbit coupling plays a very important role in the manipulation because you can have various types of interaction, the Rashpa and the Dressel house based on how you strain the structure and so on. And this creates a new way to manipulate these spins by simply putting electric fields instead of magnetic fields. And this is called electric dipole spin resonance. And based on this, you can actually control how the electric field itself by applying local gates or by moving the states between the uh, you know, quantum dots, you can create the oscillations that are needed to do the spin manipulations. Now, this is a typical operation which involves the you know, initialization, making one quantum dot lower energy, getting it into a singlet form, then manipulate, and then eject. That's the readout. So these are the standard ways. The very first way they did it was based on putting you know, oscillating magnetic fields, but now people have shifted towards electron dipole spin resonance, which is an aspect of spin orbit coupling that actually gives you the manipulation of the states based on, you know, electric field, oscillating electric fields, which is very important. And of course, these are the modern structures, some of them built on FinFETs over silicon germanium, some of them built on donors, and some of them are built on silicon, but isotopically purified silicon. Now, recent work has come up on spin orbit qubits itself. The very fact that you can have, you know, spin orbit coupling can give rise to various states of the angular momenta. And because of strain engineering, you can separate them out into different energetics. And then you have various energy scales involved based on how the orbitals interact with the you know, um, uh, spin and orbit interact. And this can be used to engineer long coherence times, as well as, you know, make them as standalone qubits. So with this, I'll move on a bit to another degree of freedom called the valleys. And so basically you have spin, valley, and, you know, uh, uh, orbit. So these are the three things that can get coupled in 2D materials that opens up new possibilities. I call it the qubits in flatland. So in graphene, let's put the long story short, you have another degree of freedom called valley, which you know very well that you have two atoms arranged in a hexagonal lattice, which forms the basis of this. And based on that, you have helical states that appear. And most importantly, you have three indices to play around spin, valley, and the sublattice pseudo spin. Now, based on that, you have a whole frontier opening up in the whole 2D materials where you play with these degrees of freedom. One of the examples that we talk about is the fact that valley and orbit and spin can get coupled in 2D materials. Specifically, bilayer graphene opens up this whole possibility of coupling valleys to spins or valleys to orbit, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one nice work where I think I've shown which work there was uh, in the beginning. Yeah, so these are the two papers here. So, yeah, yeah. so basically, what we could find is that this work showed how you can use spin orbit coupling to engineer various degrees of freedom in the graphene qubits, opening up possibilities of spin orbit valley degrees of freedom. So with this, I'll move on to some of the works we have been doing, especially we worked on what is called a valley filtering device recently. We've also shown that, you know, spin orbit coupling can lead to standard nice classical technologies too. With this, I move on to the third type of qubit, which is the Majorana qubit. 
Now, topology really brings in the possibility of engineering robust states, which will help in, you know, this qubit coherence issue. So one of the things about Majorana's is that they are topologically stable anion modes. And so by moving these modes around, you can create quantum gates instead of, you know, doing qubit rotations that are very sensitive to the decoherence. So based on this, some of the latest works involve the fact that there is this Rashba coupling that is very important in realizing this Majorana modes. These are very special modes. And it turns out that, you know, they are the edge modes of, a, you know, zero energy modes, et cetera, that were predicted long back. But the most important thing is they are detected at zero bias conductance. And Rashba engineering is a very crucial role. And one of the most important things today in the state of the art is that we have not yet detected these modes, but have come up with a topological gap protocol that tells you that possibly we have cited them recently. But all this requires, you know, engineering Rashpa interactions and all those things. And finally, the aim is to actually create networks of nanowires to move these Majorana modes around and then create the quantum computing. So we've been very actively pursuing the device modeling of all these aspects, as well as new types of Majorana devices with Rashpa interaction and the, the fact that ma, you know, magnetic insulator, superconductor hybrid systems, et cetera. So I'd like to say that we are very much interested in pursuing beyond more you know, collaborations of devices to materials. And some of the areas we are very interested right now is in all the three fields, both these 2D spintronics, topological hybrid systems, as well as 2D electronics. So with this, I'll uh, come to an end of my talk. And uh, this is my research group. And I thank the Department of Electrical Engineering. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Muralidhar, for a nice talk. So the talk is now open for questions. From, so let me go to the Korean side first, if there's an online question from the Korean side. So if not, uh, then let me go to the Indian side, particularly the persons who are present. Yeah, Professor Pal, please. Yeah. So I, I have two two questions before uh, Chairman uh, stops me. Uh, so one uh, question is like uh, um, uh, uh, like whenever you are talking about the dipolar, like uh, induced dipolar spin interactions, then is there any restrictions on the frequency? Because that will dictate that what is the dipole frequency and this wavelength radiated that will be coupled. That is number one. Number two, like, uh, is there any, uh, you know, uh, critical temperature that up beyond that, uh, the coupling or the coherence will be severely affected? So that I couldn't find in your Hamiltonian, but it was too fast. I'm sorry for that. Thank you. So firstly, um, to answer that frequency question, it really depends on the Rashba coupling factors. And there is this lambda Rashba, which is a so, I mean, not just Rashba, the spin orbit coupling, which is typically the sum of the Rashba and the Dressel house term. So that, uh, that typically is the energy scale for the, the Rabbi flip flops. Now the second question, temperature, these are all again, extremely low temperature experiments. I don't see them coming up to uh, much higher. It will be in millikelvin. But I, I think the technology is coming up. So maybe there is one Kelvin possible. I have one question. Yes. Pico amperes. Pico ampere fluctuations in current. That's what they measure. It is coming to that level. It's because of the spin blockade and the leakage. Spin blockade, technically, the current is really, really low. And when spin blockade is slightly lifted due to the, you know, uh, rotation of the qubits and readout, there will be some pico ampere level leakage currents. It is just the leakage currents that they measure, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah, I'm sure they're using these types of extremely sensitive. I have one question, if I can. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that you will agree that everything is a uh, trade-off because, uh, you know, higher spin of coupling is better for fast manipulation, but it also makes uh, 
vulnerable to charge noise. So the decurrence time is uh, getting uh, uh, lower and lower. So uh, I think uh, the optimization is uh, very important. I, my question is, um, theoretically, is there a systematic way to you know, optimize these values or find out the, what the optimal value of these uh, spin of coupling is? Thank you for the question. Yes, so um, this is the this is something I started wondering also when I start prepared this. Uh, I, I don't have an answer to this, but this is some direction I'm trying to pursue about how to optimize various parts of the Hamiltonian and especially because these are very sensitive to the gaps that are created and those gaps are again sensitive to various, you know, how they strain the elements and things like that. So this is one study I would like to really pursue. I'd like to keep in touch about that, but thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you. Question. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Professor Mulliharan. So now I have to pay the handing over the intro from the other side. Thank you. So over to Professor Lee now. Okay, uh, I'm handing over the chairmanship. Can Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, now we are, we will continue with the next speech by Professor Doyal An. He is a professor of Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of Seoul, and the co-founder and CTO of the first quantum INC. The title of his presentation will be Quantum Computing Applications, Quantum Algorithm Optimization. Let's thanks to the, the Professor Ahn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and also I would like to say, yes. Can you hear me well? Um, Professor An, yes. can you hear me? And please turn on your video and mic, please. Can you hear me well? Can okay, you? I can hear you. Okay, how about the slide? Can you see the slide? Yes. All right, sounds great. So thank you for the organizers for inviting me for this fifth Indian and Korean Academy of Engineering workshop. And my talk is a slightly from, oh, I'm, my name is David Ahn and I'm from the University of Seoul and also uh, first quantum INC, which is about three months old, the startup that I, I co-founded. We are focusing on quantum algorithms. So today's talk is about quantum computing applications, especially quantum algorithm optimization. So my talk today would be slightly different from the perspective of previous talk, which has been focused on the how the qubit implementation and on the hardware side. On the other hand, my talk will be more on, into the software and uh, application point of view. So, uh, I made a little bit of an experiment of presenting my talk in the cartoon style. So, since we are still early age of quantum computers and the most of the existing computer, quantum computers are quite noisy. So it is so-called noisy intermediate scale quantum computing or NISQ. And the bottleneck of the noise intermediate quantum computing, NISQ, is that, the first of all, if you can see the bottom, oh, sorry. How can I go back to the previous one? Okay. So every quantum algorithm has been, is represented by the quantum circuit. So the classical computers you need to put into the, the machine languages or bits. But today's quantum computer can understand only the elementary quantum circuit. For example, this is a quantum algorithm that converts the computational qubit basis into the circuit qubits. And you can see the number of single qubit gate as well as the two qubit gates. And the, 
There are two definitions of regarding the, the quantum circuit, which is width and depth. Width is the number of qubits that you represent as input for the quantum circuit, and depth is the number of independent the quantum operations that can be done at the same time. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five. So this, in this simple circuit, the depth is five. But the problem is, even, even the, sing, the very elementary quantum gate, you need to have a lot of uh, elementary gate of single qubit and two qubit gate. For example, three qubit topoly gate is represented by decomposed into 16 single qubit and two qubit gates, such as a controlled knot. And four qubit topoly gate, you need 106 elementary gate. And since the each gate also represents the error of the qubit operation, so in the NISQ era, you need to reduce the number of qubits for the get a reliable computational result because we, we don't have a error correction yet. And for that is the, the domain of fault tolerant computing. And I guess we, we are guessing that it will take another five, maybe or 10 years to get the fault tolerant computing for even the small number of quantum the qubits. So the, the priority of optimizing the quantum algorithm is to reduce or optimize the number of quantum elementary gates. So that's the quandary that we are having. We have a small number of qubits that can be utilized in the NISQ quantum computers, but even the small elementary gate, you need a huge number of elementary gates for the the simple gate. So if you look at the, the classical electronics or digital electronics, there is a way that is called Carnot map which can be used to reduce the number of the elementary gate, and which is actually the basis of a modern integrated circuit design. Every design of a digital circuit is based on Carnot map. So I can show you a simple explanation that this Carnot map technique has been based on the Boolean algebra and such as a consensus theorem. So X, Y, Z are the, the Boolean variables. Next prime is a complement or, or operated with a not operation. So assuming that the consensus theorem says X, Y plus x prime z plus y z can be represented by x y plus x prime z. So three different gate operations can be reduced by two. So this is a very important theorem, so I'm going to go through the, the, the proof. Uh, this is well known for the engineering department or electronics engineering, but probably not quite familiar for the physicist because the, the digital electronics is usually not taught in the, the physics department. So let's go back. The, the, the original problem is x, y plus x prime z plus y, z. And the last term can be represented by the y, z multiplied by y, by one. And one can be represented by the addition of x plus x prime. Because you, if, if any Boolean variable together with uh, this complement is equal to one. So the second line goes x, y plus x prime z plus x, y, z plus x prime, y, z. And so those of the x, y and x prime, z can be factored together. So if, x, y, if we put x, y as a common factor, then we have this one, one plus z. And x prime, z with x prime, y, z is x prime z plus one plus y. But in Boolean algebra or digital algebra, anything added with one is always one. So this becomes x y plus x prime z. So this proves the theorem. 
So we can use this to, this is a typical example of a digital circuit problem. You have a truth table. This is X and Y are the Boolean variables, and F is a function. So assuming that we have the following function, so when x, y is 0, 0, f is 1. When x is 0, 1, you have 1. If 1, 0 is, we got the 0. And 1, 1, if you have a 0. This is a fu the function that we, I, I've just designed this arbitrary function. And then you can put in the truth table. Then x is 0 or 1, y is 0 or 1. Then this relation can be put into this way, because this x, y is 0, 0, we have 1, right? And when x, y is 0, or 1 is 1. So basic technique of a cardinal map is if you have a 1, either column or row, you can contract uh, the relations. So you can actually remove this out of the computation. So that means the original truth table function is x prime, y prime plus x, y. But after you apply the cardinal map, then the result is only single variables. So in this case, in this simple example, we have a two elementary gate operations can be reduced by one, which will give the equivalent to the same result. So this is almost a 50% reduction in the classical case. But will it be possible to apply it to the quantum case? And I found that the answer is yes. So, so we are going to investigate the quantum version of a coronal map to reduce the complexity of a quantum circuit. So how does it compare with the current practice? I mean, for Nielsen and Chuang, we have an elementary gate. We have a, some elementary gate decomposed into one qubit and two qubit gates. And we found that we have shown two cases for four qubit topoly gate and five qubit to fully gate, then the reduction is, we have a 50, 60% of the original number of elementary gate, and for the larger gate, we have 46%. So we get almost half of the, the required elementary gate can be used to actual execution of the quantum circuits. That means we can improve the computation speed even for quantum computers by, we have X, Y, Z as a quantum state, and each state is represented by the quantum operation, which is a result of Boolean algebra. And the goal is to, to, to optimize the quantum circuit by re optimizing each argument. So this is a little bit abstract, so let's go a little bit more details. So this is a typical controlled unitary operations for two cubic gate, so which can be represented by graphically or in tabular forms, this one new. So this operation is actually decomposed in the every quantum information textbook. So x, y is a, x is a controlled qubit, y is a target qubit, and c is a, this operation, the, the representation of unitary operations. So this controlled operation means whenever x is zero, the, the input state is not changed. So when x, x is equal to zero, then the output is again the x, y, same as the input. On the other hand, f x is equal to one, then this unitary operation is enabled. So uh, the result is given by this. This component of the unitary operators, O, y, and x, zero and same as one, then this whole operation can be written down this one line. And the amazingly interesting thing is this extended zero qubit is correspond to zero, zero, and zero, one. Actually, actually in this case, this controlled unit is not activated, so output is the same as the original. And this one extended one qubit, the x component is one, so in this case, the controlled the unitary operations are enabled. So this basic idea has been actually patented a few years ago 
So we have several U.S. and Japanese patent, and as well as Korean patent, granted already about this concept. And this can be extended into the actual decomposition of a quantum circuit. So assuming that we have the following circuit, and this circuit can be decomposed into two subgroups, subcircuits, and each subcircuit can be represented by the, the, the graphical method that I explained previous, in the previous slide. So each HU circuit can be represented by this truth table. This is quaternal map like a truth table or quantum version, and HU is the same as this. So this whole operation can be represented by the graphical multiplication. So each component is multiplied by each. So I, I become I, U, U become U square, U, I become U, I become U. So this whole circuit operation can be decomposed into the, the single equation, of equation with the extended qubits. So it turns out that this definition of quantum quantum map is quite intuitive and can be applied using graphical method automatically as in the case of a quantum classical quantum map. How much time do I have? 10 minutes? You have some two or three minutes, please. Oh, really? Okay, I'll go a little faster. So we have applied this to four qubit topoly gate. So this is the composition of a four qubit topoly gate as written as can be found in this Nan Chuang's text, the famous textbook. And this is three qubit topoly gate. Topoly gate. Each, each three qubit topoly gate, you need a 16 elementary gates, so you can, you can actually count how many uh, number of elementary gates for this four qubit topoly gate is 106. So we, and we can apply recursively the Carano map to get the third line. So it can be actually simplified. So the, the, the initial four qubit topoly gate is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So 16, the depth of a four qubit topoly gate is 16. The, the reduced topoly gate using Carano map is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So 11. So you need, uh, you reduce the elementary operations up to 11 from out of 16. That's about 60 or 40, about 40%. But this is only the depth, but actually the number of elementary gate is even more significant. So, so this is a decomposed circuit uh, actually checked with the Carnot map. And I'm not going to go through the details. And the final result is you get, we obtained 106 into 45 gates. So it's almost a 60% reduction in the number of elementary gates required to, op to, to, to operate the four qubit topoly gate. And it was published about two years ago and also become uh, one of the finalists uh, for the US Air Force competition. And recently we have applied this result to the, the quantum Fourier transform. Uh, quantum Fourier transform is a quantum version of a discrete Fourier transform, and which is most, one of the most versatile quantum algorithms, and and this is one of the key algorithms for the for, the, for implement Shor's factoring algorithm, and quantum amplitude estimation, which is actually can replace the Monte Carlo simulation, and for solving linear equations and also partial differential equations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So quantum Fourier transform is really really important, and. We have applied this technique to reduce the, so first into the, the fault tolerance case. And in fault tolerance case, the, the most costly, the gate is T gate. So we reduced it, apply the Carano map to reduce the amount of T count and T depth. And also we got some, we, we, we write the 
the circuit into the NISQ form, and then we got some elementary result. Since we have only a few minutes, I'll just go through the details, and this is our result. So, so far, the known T count and T depth is eight times n log n, and T depth is two n log n. But our result is about half of those results. And so we are writing the paper, in the, in the process of writing the paper. And also we have done the NISQ version of our quantum Fourier transform and checked with the ion Q machine. So this is our conclusion. So I'll let go, this, go through the details. And still there are many challenges. And is how to mitigate the errors is one of the, the challenges for this quantum case. And since I haven't done the, our collaborators, I, I'm going to introduce my collaborators. I should have done in the first place, but it's better not still acknowledge them better than not, right? So, so my, my collaborators, uh, uh, Professor Warner Miller of Florida Atlantic University and Dr. Poor Asing of the U.S. Air Force Research Lab. And this work was supported by the Korean National Research Foundation and U.S. Air Force and Amazon. And my student as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor An. Okay, it's time to have some questions and answers. And from Okay, Indian side first, please ask your some, leave your comments or some questions for, to Professor An. Hello. Hello. Yes, uh, so uh, this is a very interesting approach, uh, definitely. Uh, but my question is if uh, we also <clears throat> take into account fault tolerance. So once we do uh, this sort of optimization and then look at the fault tolerant library of gates, which is, which is going to be different, uh, again, some amount of uh, uh, reduction needs to be done. So therefore in the NISQ era, it would be interesting to also see how that goes or can we integrate that while we are doing this reduction? And of course, uh, including error correcting blocks as well to get the actual uh, cost of the circuit. Thank you. What Thank are you. your thoughts on this? Thank you, this is a really good question. And there are different point of view for the optimizing the quantum circuit for the NISQ and fault tolerant case. In, in, in the case of fault-tolerant case, the most costly gate is uh, T-gate. So you need to reduce the number of T-gate and also depth. So that's actually what we have done for quantum Fourier transform in the first place. But T-gate is not very well executed for the, the NISQ machine. Right. So, so you need to replace the T-gate, decompose the T-gate into the like, rotation gate. So for that case, the depth can be slightly incre increased, but no, you can reduce the number of the, the elementary gates still. So that's quite a tricky question, and still we are still working on that. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. OK, is there other questions from Indian side? Okay, the other is from Korean side. Is there any questions or comments? Okay, uh, we have 10 minutes behind the schedule. Okay, okay, let's thanks to the Professor An. And now this is the end of the first session of today's um, workshop. And we will have break for about some 15 minutes. And let's start, let's resume our some presentation from 11.35 in 
Korean time, I uh, Indian time, and uh, three five in Korean time. Am I correct? I think let's meet in some fifteen minutes. Thank you, thank you very much. So we have about three and a half time difference, hour difference between India and Korea, right? Thank you. Thank you.
Quantum devices, both with silicon, germanium, hardware, as well as recently we have started work on getting the in the 2D material. And also, we are working this hardware for the photo detectors, the infrared sensor, and electronic sensor. So, today I will be talking about the mostly silicon quantum information technology, and I will discuss quantum guard in a complete bit, and I will not go details of that because it's already covered. In the uh, one speaker, so I will mostly go single electron pin tube and double quantum bar charge tubes devices. So there are all over, there are different approaches going on what to make the quantum computer uh, using semiconductor solid state electrons or spin tube or superconducting tube, ram and photons, uh, topological as well as multi material state uh, tube devices. Uh, if you want to make a quantum computer, there are certain criteria you how you choose the different, different types of TV. So there are certain criteria which must be followed. So these are the criteria. And if you look for the silicon based uh, TV system, like uh, they are mostly fulfill this criteria. But if you see, there are one major challenge people are facing because it's already like a silicon TV started one decade back. But why we are not going up for the making a many qubit system, whereas proton qubit or superconducting qubit, they reach to the many qubit system. So there are challenges are there. One such challenge is the scalability. Although we talked about the silicon and there are targets for the scalability, but the problem is that how you make the entanglement for different qubits. You can make n number of qubits, like for they are different. Like, but how do you interact itself? Uh, if I make some interaction or cycle by cycle interaction, and the gauge operation is very complex. See, so these are the major challenge for the silicon TV. and many groups are trying to solve those challenges. And you know, the Indian scientists also, different scientists are working on this aspect. And for the algorithm side, we have many Indian scientists to be working on over and we are trying to find the key. Uh, along with the charge QB, we are on our groups we are focusing. So we are making that QB, we have to make a good charge sensor and for the silicon quantum information technology. And there are different approaches you can make a quantum dot based charge sensor or point contact devices. Along with this direction, we are also working on making the charge sensor. We are mostly working on nanoware based uh, quantum dot devices for the charge sensor. The uh, challenges is that you have to get sophisticated fabrication tools to make the gate length like a 20 nanometer or 15 nanometer gate length devices to make the quantum block or you want to make the gate defined quantum block there also. 
So we are also fabricated to started the fabrication and I believe in our team for nanoware based uh, single electron devices. And although we also not, uh, we have shown that even if you make the uh, nanoware transistors, even the dark gate will like, uh, open 200 nanometers or uh, 300 nanometer devices, and you have a multi open in this. Uh, Still, you can get the single electron rocket because that open open tunneling will happen. If you make the nano dimension, is very small, right? Like if you are making 20, 10 nanometer height and 20 nanometer width, like that. So, there you can get the single electron. To make the single hole conditioner as tensor in the previous speaker, we have some advantage for the whole cube system. There you have a spin of a coupling. So, you can do the gate operation fast. But the disadvantage is that the coherent time is the problem. So there is a both advantage and disadvantage for the electron and both qubits are there. And uh, people are trying to optimize those effects. And I discuss mostly the three uh, qubit system. One is the first one I discuss single atom spin qubit system. What are the challenges facing in this single atom spin qubit in silicon? And then double electron spin qubit already. Discuss and I'll discuss later space because nobody talks about the charge qubit of the charge qubit based on silicon double quantum dot. So single atom spin qubit, like in a silicon, now we have the technology, you can precisely put the single dope in the channel of the transistor, and there you can use that single dope N. Like if you put the phosphorus, then 15th electrons you can use as a good two-level quantum systems. And if you put, there's no pen on 28 silicon, so there is no, uh, twin, like the 29 isotope is not there, so you can increase the coherence time in the few um, hundred microseconds. And there are uh, worldwide, a lot of groups are now working on the 28 silicon uh, most spin qubit because they have a coherence time is longer. And why we are going for the silicon based uh, single dopen qubit? Because you can do this single dope N with the other sem semiconductor also, like uh, or the vacancy center in the nitrogen, or you can do the gallium arsenide. So silicon has a large orbital energy, so you can your qubit can work little bit like the higher temperature. Higher temperature means you can work 300 millikelvin instead of 10, uh, 20 millikelvin or uh, 50 millikelvin. You can work nicely even up to 300 millikelvin silicon qubit because they have a orbital energy higher and weak spin orbit coupling. So you could have the coherence time longer. But the problem is that even if coherence time is longer, then the gate operation will decrease. Because if you have a spin orbit coupling is larger, then you can do the two qubit gate operation very fast. So there is a both uh, like advantage and disadvantages are there. And how can you implant the single dope in the transistor? And there are always mainly people are using two technology. One is the like this uh, simple nano implanter or the Lawrence Berkeley lab. They are the only single ion implanter tool is there. What is there in the STM tip? And there is a small hole is there. So along with the scanning, you can precisely put your single dope wherever you want to put because you are doing the scanning talent um, like the STM and then you do the Ion implantation. So this tool is available, and if you want to know more about this tool, it is already there in this journal. And how to so for a qubit, spin qubit, or any qubit system, as I mentioned in the past slide, there are certain criteria. So first, you have to initialize the qubit, and then manipulate the qubit, and then measure the qubit. What is the state? So in the for the silicon spin qubit, these all three are optimized. Like you can read out the spin readout can be done by using the single electron transistor uh, where it is very charge sensitive. And if you apply some DC magnetic field, then you can separate the spin up and spin down state. Now you align the single electron transistor energy level, just middle of the these two spin up and spin down state. And then your if you now the once you align the sing, single electron transistor and a Fermi level here, then the R spin only tunnel through. And then if you are getting some current, then you know this is the half spin. So this is called the spin to charge conversion. So that way you measure the spin state. And to manipulate the spin, you use mostly the electron spin resonance line, where you send the 
uh, AC current, mainly we send the uh, microwave signal through this or the RF field, you can send the current and then it will produce time varying magnetic field and it will uh, manipulate the spin state. So these are the three and depending upon the pulse width of the microwave pulse, it will determine where you want to put uh, your qubit on the block sphere. So that way you manipulate the spin qubit. And uh, along with the previous approach, single ion implantation, you can do the single dopant qubit using uh, called the hydrogen lithography. In the silicon charge state, first you can terminate with the hydrogen atom. And after that, by scanning telling microscope tip, you can remove the hydrogen bond wherever you want. And then if you send the phosphine gas, wherever you remove the hydrogen band, the phosphine molecule will sit there. So depending upon how many hydrogen bond you remove, the how many number of phosphine atom uh, molecule will sit there, that will determine. So by deterministically, you can put the phosphorus on silicon and then you anneal it, then the phosphorus will go inside the silicon and hydrogen will go it. So that way you can put the single dopen or multi dopen precisely on silicon. Some of the groups worldwide working on this project also for spin qubit on silicon. And this I am leaving because I don't want to this already talk in the speaker. So what I want to discuss another aspect of the silicon qubit is the charge qubit. What is the charge qubit quantum systems? So if you make it two quantum dot, now if you put, can move the charge from the left dot to right dot, and you can make the superposition of this left and right dot. So depending upon where you are putting the charge, like the left dot or right dot, so that way you make a two level systems. And you can do the readout of this, like where the dot, uh, like the electron is there left or right by using the single electron transistor. And you can initialize this qubit by the gate operation and you can manipulate by the pulse, DC pulse or microwave pulse. So I work in this uh, project and Hitachi lab previously. Now we are trying on this charge qubit on 2D materials at IIT Delhi. So this charge qubit also people have started not the making the physically quantum dot. So the previous case, uh, which I've shown the picture of the physically making the quantum dot, you can make the quantum dot by gate defined, like electrostatically. So by putting the gate design, you can deplete it or create the charge carrier underneath of SiO2 or dielectric, wherever you want. So by designing the gate, you can electrostatically create the quantum dot. And this is like a advantage is that if you electrically create, create the quantum dot, then the tunnel coupling, you can tune because you have a gate between the left and right dot. What is the tunnel coupling? So those advantages are there for the electrostatic. But the problem is that you have to lithography step is much more complex and you cannot put the multiple. Like if you want to do multi qubit state, then for defining the quantum dot itself, you are using six, seven gate and the actual gate operation, it is very difficult. So these are the single uh, double quantum dot charge qubit, which I am skipping. So you can precisely control the charge position by left and right dot by the voltage between the two gate. And this is the charge stability diagram you can see. And we measure the coherence time at millikelvin temperature, like 300 millikelvin, we can get up to 520 nanosecond coherence time. And now go to the for multi qubit systems. So you can physically define the double two double quantum dots or many, many double quantum dots. So we have fabricated during at Hitachi Cambridge lab where we have shown the two qubit system using and similarly you can precisely position the phosphorus dopen. So then you can make the, this is one spin qubit and this is another spin qubit and you can have the exchange interaction between these two qubit but the distance has to be very small like around 10 nanometer order. So that is the technology we have now, now the technology you can pull the dopen very nearby around 20 nanometer. And this is the status of the silicon based qubit system. People have shown different like either ion implanted single dopen or quantum dot. So they have achieved R28 silicon. You can achieve the uh, coherence time, T2 time for a single qubit and C0 gate operation up to 99% fidelity. And people have shown two qubit gate operations swap gate very fast around 100 picosecond. But if you want to make the multi qubit system in silicon, challenges is that how you make the different resonant frequency for different qubit. Because otherwise you don't know which qubit you are working because you are sending the microwave signals. I, I can send microwave different frequency of microwave through the microwave line. 
So you have to design the magnet for splitting the Zeeman splitting for each qubit for different energy. So people now started using the, uh, like the varying magnetic field magnet design in the chip. So you send the like the least little bit asymmetry in the magnet. So this group has shown like the six such qubit. So the resonant frequency of the each qubit is different, but they have not shown, although they are calling it is a six quantum processor, but not all six qubit are entangled. Only up to three qubit, they have shown entangled. So that is the major challenge. So you can make 200, 500 qubit, but they are not 200, 500 qubit quantum computer, unless you make the all 500 qubit entangled state. You cannot get the advantage of what we call quantum supremacy. So those are the challenge, how you design the gate and this, like if you want to go silicon multi-qubit system, so how you can incorporate long range interaction, like 100 or 200 qubit. So now the knowing path is that you can interact coherently with the photon, this qubit, and then send the, like the coherent signal to the other qubit state. And that's why the coherent spin and photon interaction is much more important. And people have started this thing for the long range interaction of the qubit, then it will be really scalable. So, uh, and I'm ending here. This is the last slide where you can see the status of the different qubit. Although silicon qubit started uh, 10 years back, still we are two or three qubit entangled state. You can make eight qubit system, but what is the maximum number of entangled that determine the major advantage of the qubit. Thank you. So uh, this is the group which, uh, uh, our group is working on the mostly the 2D quantum material groups. Recently, we set up the MB for the 2D material group at IIT Delhi, and it is funded by uh, IIT Delhi. Uh, so, we already started WS2 Celeride and mostly the Celeride based material uh, 2D. And if anybody wants to collaborate, they can grow, get the high quality 2D materials from our center. And also, we have started the quantum competing with IIT Bombay and DI for all project is going on. And we have started working on the get quantum dot Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Nice lecture of people leading the silicon quantum technology. Now it's open for the questions. So let me invite the, the Korean delegates first for any question for Dr. Dash. Uh, I am Captain. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. My my question is about making gate defined quantum dot using existing FD SOI technology. And yeah. I think it is important to make a tunnel barrier between source uh, quantum dot and drain contact. And I am aware of one technique that is developed by uh, Lab CEA in French. Yes, where yes. they use a thick spacer. But I think, uh, you know, using thick spacer is not always convenient because when you make, uh, we want to make a quantum dot along with, uh, you know, traditional transistors on same chip, it is not convenient. So my question is, do you know any other techniques to make uh, tunnel barriers uh, using FDSOI technology? Uh, no, so yeah, that challenges is there because uh, both uh, the Leti as well as the Intel are working uh, mostly the Leti uh, with the uh, uh, University College London and UNSW. They have a big project on this scalable quantum computer using the silicon or insulator technology for the nanoware. But those challenges is there like the long range interaction. You can make that two qubit system easily, but if you have to scale up from two qubit to four qubit, like I can make a nanoware like I can make a linear chain of eight quantum dots, but how the first and last quantum dot will interact with themselves. So that is the major challenge facing. Uh, so that's why in the long term, I think to make scalable, we have to go for the this uh, electron and photon interaction. That is the solution. No, his, uh, his question was more whether can you have a kind of insulating layer for each of these separately using this technology? Yeah, 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 my question was different. My question was, how do you make a tunnel barrier uh, in order to make a confinement potential for the quantum dot using a transistor fabrication technology? 
So you can make the gate, another gate to control the tunnel barrier. So people are making like the two double, like the two side gate as well as the to make the control the tunneling between the quantum dots. They put the another guard uh, where you can deplete the or you can deplete fully or partially. So your tunnel capacitance or uh, tunnel delta resistance can be controlled. Yeah, yeah. I think we can discuss it later. Uh, okay. Thanks. One more question, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this movie is yes. yeah. oh, nice talk. Thank you. So one quick question. What is the current update about the communication between qubits with that photon thing that you talked about? I mean, the long distance is the main problem now, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Could you just quickly tell me the update? So Thank you. I have shown one paper. So that paper they have shown like they said the uh, coupling of the mostly previously fast on the charge qubit coupling with the photon that then now people have started spin qubit coupling with the photon. So at the beginning, it is a charge qubit photon that was much more easy. But the coupling with the spin qubit with the photon is much more easy. Micro photon is much more challenging. So people are starting. Uh, so the, maybe the last question. Just one point. Whenever you are creating the quantum dot artificially, what is the depth of the wire? Uh, so uh, depth of the wire. So there are people uh, like how, what is the, like for the fully deflected SOI, what is the top SOI we have to do? That will determine like the energy difference, like the, how depth you are going to the well. Create the well. So in that case, it is possible to create the two sub bands, which is more than the room temperature energy. It is possible, the, but we have to like the silicon, silicon, the core radius is 6 nanometer. Yeah. So even if you pull down at 100 millikelvin or 3 Kelvin, so you have to make a quantum dot, or it is like in that order. But in the fully deflated SOI or with the 50 nanometer gate length, you can create the, the sample, but not with the So the, my point is that in the basis of the charge base qubit, is it possible to operate it at the room temperature? Uh, if you make the energy level that much, so that is challenging there. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, okay, so it's a pleasure to hand over a moment to, to Dr. Das. Over to Okay, thank you, Professor Das. Okay, the next presenter from Korea side will be Dr. Jin Dong Song, and he is a head of center for optoelectronic convergence system at Korea Institute of, Institute of Science and Technology. And Dr. Song will deliver a speech titled L0D, 1D, 2D, and 3D materials prepared in KIST for the quantum information technology. Okay, Dr. Song, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So, okay. <sighs> so, everything fine? So yes. hello, my name is Jin Dong Song of Korean Institute of Science and Technology. The title of the talk is, uh, I mean, uh, multi-dimensional materials prepared in kits for the quantum information technology. So I present many things, but all of this thing is uh, done by, I mean, my coworker, then my students, and then sometimes me. <laughs> So in KIST, we have a 9 MB system. Actually, we started our 3 pub growth around 1981. And then recently, we upgrade our MB systems. So we grow everything on everything. Especially, uh, we try to grow, uh, I mean, a three pipe materials on so silicon, germanium, or sometimes so other other materials. And then, recently, we try to grow the three pipe or other materials on the insulator, such as oxide. And then, with this system, we grow the some artificial alloy, and then to the quantum earth. In this case, this is quantum cascade laser, and this one D and zero D structures. Actually, my dream is uh, to making. This, this kind of some photonic devices uh, in, integrated with everything, sensor, detector, and modulator, and single photon source, single photon detector, everything inside is my dream. But right now, my job is making a, a part for that. So everybody know that this is a famous uh, candidate for the qubit. Uh, I'm trying with uh, all this one, and then it has a very, I mean, uh, 
I mean, a well-established technology. And next, the supercomputing loops is right now technology. So many companies are interested in making supercomputer. And then this is one of the, the candidates for the, the qubit system. I mean, uh, the, the defect center or some other centers in the material system, like uh, some uh, the uh, diamond and centers and silicon carbide centers, and then some calcium nitride centers, and then sometimes uh, some centers in uh, silicon devices, and then the semiconductor, semiconductor quantum that is also one of the candidate, and then the many others the candidates exist uh, this one and topological com quantum computing is maybe the next generations the deep, the materials or devices for the quantum computing anyway i will focus on this one so my dreams i, I got this picture from the website i know that this is famous guy <clears throat> so my dream is as a this complex system make this small one this this image is a kind of micro size photon devices made by the Professor Rodel in this and this bowl labs. And then yeah, I supplied samples. So and then he made this kind of thing. This is one of the good the I mean I, what is that the, the idea to 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 make my dream. So I will talk about the material system. Uh, the first material system is 3-5 quantum dots. Actually, 3-5 quantum dot is, uh, there is many 3-5 quantum dots. So the, this quantum dot is, is uh, grown by many methods. The famous method is SK growth method. It uses uh, some strange relaxation method. Mm -hmm. Actually, we grow the, the indomatanite quantum dot on everything, such as the aluminum gallium dot or silicon. Sometimes we grow the indium aluminum quantum dot. With that, we can make uh, some very low density the 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 quantum dot. For, for example, this links is a, a diameter of the five uh, fifty micrometer, uh, and then you can find around one hundred quantum dot over fifty by fifty micrometer squares around, and then you can make ten dot and one dot. This very low density sing, single photon source quantum dot is actually this is a listen to one is a is a useful if you want to make a, some uh, optical system system for example this for example this sample and then this is data is from the NIST and then he made that I mean uh, the caucus made this kind of system to find out where is quantum dot and then you know there is a, some the cross bars so this is a kind of the the point to check where is this quantum dot. With that, you can make uh, some the processes. This two thing is also made by this kind of thing. So we can find the quantum dot and then we can make uh, some good uh, structures to enhance the extraction ratio. So you can make uh, some good quantum dot. In this case, the G2 is 0 0.050. That's a reasonably good. And next step, we are making us some 1.55 meter quantum dot with some uh, the wafers. So uh, there is a two groups in the world who made us some 1.55 quantum dot. One group is using in the post by in the post by very good. But uh, there is many reason to use the gallium methods. for example, cheaper. And second thing is it uh, it can make a good the uh, optical devices in the in case of in the post pipe case, you can use indium gallium, uh, indium gallium aluminum atenide or indium aluminum atenide for the, the optical structure. In this case, you need some very long period of structures necessary to make a good DBR structure. But in case of gallium atenide, you can make just a few layer with a gallium atenide, aluminum atenide, you can make a good DBR layer. And then, so that's the reason why I try it. So, no, whole point of the, this idea is we are using indium-25 for that gallium atenide because indium-25 gallium atenide has uh, some good lattice mismatch with the indium atenide to make quantum dot. So in case of indium post pipe, indium the atenide quantum dot have a, a kind of special shape like we call the dash shape of a quantum dot. Sometimes it's quantum that shape is not circle. It's uh, like uh, some sweet potato, you know, something like that. So yeah, it 
always there is a good point and bad point to make uh, the the for the shape of quantum dot. But anyway, we like circular quantum I mean, symmetrical quantum dot. So I made a sort the symmetrical quantum dot, and then it's so one point five five micrometer around 20, 20 Kelvin. And then we made some process and find that okay, we can make some single photon, the quantum dot, the single photon from the these structures. The next step is we are making droplet quantum dot. Droplet quantum is another method to make a quantum dot. The good point of droplet quantum dot is the density and shape is controlled by different mechanisms. So if you put the, some gallium in the MB system uh, with a very, in very high vacuum state around 10 to the minus nine tor below it, then then you can make some a kind of dot state. We call this kind of thing a droplet. So when you put the, some arsenic, the quantum the shape changes. If you put the arsenic in up, and not very enough, you can make a quantum dot. And then if we if you change the some arsenic flux operation method, you can make a pit disk, link, or laterally quantum dot. Actually, pit is very useful. <clears throat> so the droplet quantum dot, good point of droplet quantum dot is this is uniformly grown because we have uh, many technology on pure droplet growth, and then shape is different thing. So we focus on change the some density and shape and size, uh, not, not except the size and density or the, this kind of thing. So with the, with the two inch vapors, we found that it's very uniform over all vapors. So it means that we can grow the some low density quantum dot very large size. And then in this case, we made some droplet quantum dot, and then we found that this double exton and an excited exton state is found. And then this is process how to make it. And then finally, we grow the some droplet, droplet quantum dot with a very thin the, the capping layer. In case of indium and quantum dot, we need thick the, the gallium acid capping layer. But in this case, just three nanometers is enough because there is no stress. So you can see the uh, position of quantum dot even in FEM. And then you can find the optical property of quantum dot in a and uh, in uh, the, uh, the micro PL system, and then you can find it. And then, yeah, you, you can find it the both way. Actually, you can do the some process with the FIB or SEM. And next one is we made uh, some link structures. The link structure is useful to the use to understand the, the, <clears throat> the, 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 the AB oscillation or this kind of thing. This is a physics, physics guidebook. And next step is we can change the some the content of shape. For example, we if we grow the gallium arsenide on gallium arsenide droplet, it's possible. And if we put the in the arsenide, in this case, the this droplet is special point. So you can make special in the arsenide. When you grow another the gallium arsenide gallium on it, only in the matter structure is left. So in this case, I mean uh, just link, and you can find. So this is double this is double coupled in the matter six coupled in the matter this kind of thing is easily made and another thing is pitting so recently there is a two guys two to movement to make us you to use the pit structures but in our case we hope to make a pit and then fill it with the matter but other guys they want to i mean make us some pit and then fill it with uh, some gallium matter Basically, they use aluminum gallium acid, the, the amino layers. They can make upside down in the, mass, in the gallium acid and quantum dot. What is good for it? Symmetrical. So in our case, we make a, make a drop, drill, and drill again, and then make finally we feed it. So this is the, 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 the preliminary structure. The, the result is some the quantum dot, the, the field quantum dot. In this case, we can it's a good point of the, this idea is we can change the some the density and then the the wavelengths and shape. This kind of is, is uh, the controlled separately in a, in a, in, a, in the normal SK mode. This is three. The important the idea is coupled, so it's not easy. But this is separately. That's the reason why I like it. And then by separation of the the peak with some the mechanical the the, the fabrication method, we made this kind of single proton uh, the line out of it. And then this is a sub our suggestion of the 
the, our single photon source structures. So uh, this is a German German idea. This is uh, some French idea. This is our idea. In our case, we suggest uh, some LDBR structures. LDBR, the, this is uh, some etching method. We etch the aluminum, aluminum gallium acid, and only gallium acid and air is uh, directly made. So we design it. And then made it at 77 K. It's uh, the G2 is 0 0.4, but at 2010 or 20 Kelvin, it's much, much reduced. And another approach is our droplet method is useful. For example, if you make a pattern with the AFM or some EV listener method, due to the defect that the quantum that in it is very bad. But in our case, I mean, uh, we can put the same gallium atom and we can remove the defect. You know, if this this I mean a pre-patterned point is is a kind of some special point for the gallium. So they want go to the, the gallium go to the these holes, and then we using some the repetition of the the edge pitting. So after that, defect is disappear. So we are we are focusing on this one right now. And then we also using us making us some um, SIL structure to get mass to enhance the, or the, the, the optical light and the single photon source out, out of these structures. And then so after that, I have uh, some, just to, I have uh, some five minutes. So uh, I will do the some kind of advertisement of the key star, the, the activity for the, the quantum information technology. So uh, basically we are material supplier. So my group is material supplying groups. Other groups are quantum the information groups. So we made some NBN for the single SNSPD. So recently we made the TC the 15K for the for, for better devices. And then we are making some the gallium acid detectors or some lasers or this kind of thing is to integrate in the silicon photonics devices of detector and bonding detect system. And then this is one of the, the one of the, our results with them to make a microfabrication for the silicon photonics. We made a micro MG Mahajanda interpolimate, micro ring, micro disc, it's a in eight inch fab. And then we have a facility make a silicon pad to, to detect the single photon detection. And then we have uh, some nano wires the high quality nanowires in the antimony one in the arsenal nanowires for yes so it be because we have mb system mb system can deposit the, the aluminum in vacuum without making oxide on the nanowire surface so we are making these structures also we supplied some high quality the low band gap two deck structures for the quantum computing guy so this is specially designed the the Indomasa two deck. So you know you can find the Indomasa and the channel and the the I mean the gate that the, the the what's that the the doping layer is below it. To, it. This is useful for the quantum the information because Indomasa is good. And another point is the, the this dense this doping layer below it. The, the so the the carrier is not easily touched by these layers. And then we also made uh, some indomatanai two deck for the for the spin fat structures. And then this is also useful for the continuation. And then we make on uh, some special big cells to you for the some the ion trapped guys uh extension uh, devices and then we made a special detectors for the for some of the long wave rings. And then you know we grow the some the this you no know, atomic the controls of this layer. This is our the 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 quantum cascade laser. It means that our growing technology is good. And then we also supplied aluminum gallium and gallium the gallium is the two decks for the quantum computing guys. And then this is a core cost result. And then we supply one million the centimeter scale for VS at low temperature for your help. And then Yes, my job is to supply the sample to the quantum information guy. So, and then I'm so happy to work with the, the new guys uh, who who can, I mean, uh, go for the quantum information. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Song. Uh, is there some questions or, or comments? Okay, let's some Indian side first. And please ask us some questions.
thank you for this very interesting talk. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So would you please uh, uh, enlighten me about this correlation width of your uh, single photon uh, uh, emitter? That what is the uh, autocorrelation width of that? Because that information I'm missing. Uh, pardon? So basically we using uh, the this kind of some G2 is measured by my coworker. So G2 measuring G2 process is a standard, I think so. So okay. they you they you I mean uh, I go to some single photon source. This yeah. the oh. main process it they find it and then oh. make uh, some detector and measure it. Yeah. You you are going from the single source to mm. array of sources. So my question is that whenever you are adding one, two, three, for example, are you compromising on the coherence length or you are compromising on the phase correlations? So that was my question. How to assume the phase, uh, you know, coherence between all the array uh, uh, of the sources? But there is a two method. It's actually not my, it's not my work, but okay. there is a two method to my caucus work. The first thing is making us some, we call single photon train. I mean, uh, this is, uh, they said, uh, quantum machine gun, so they said so. So, so up to now, the, the University of Bucheburg and the U USTC China made the succeed, success, succeed in a 60 quantum, the single photon strain is same. So I mean, every 60, so during 60, the, the, the pot, I mean, a success, the successive photons are same. This is proven. The, this is the, another measured method. So in this case, you can use some the time delay system and actually they'll drop and then they make it. And this is first one. And second one is modification. Great. So we have some method to modificate each quantum dot. Mm. Got it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And is there other questions from Indian side? Probably no. Okay. And is there some question from Korean side? Thank you. Well, uh, so I'm not the session chair, but session chair is the speaker this time. So it's my great privilege to invite uh, Professor Shamit Kumar Ray. Shamit Kumar Ray is INHR professor, the Department of Physics, Indian. Technology Kharagpur. Uh, Professor Ray will be talking on light matter interactions in 2D materials for quantum photonic devices. Professor Ray. So thank you organizers, uh, particularly Devutosh for inviting me uh, for this prestigious workshop and very nice to interact with my Korean colleagues. Uh, this last, last one, last one. Last one, last one. So, uh, so I'll be speaking on uh, the light matter interactions in 2D materials for quantum photonic devices. So from the morning, actually, by the, before the tea session, we have seen all spin-based spin quantum devices. And probably the last lecture uh, was, was by Professor Shang was more on the single photon emitters. So photon-based uh, quantum system, I'll, say, I'll not say quantum computing system. So we'll be uh, talking a little bit physics and our approach to making some devices in the future. So, <clears throat> yeah. so I'll be talking mostly on the two dimensional materials. I mean, so your, your last, last talk was on Gallium Mars night. So my talk will be mostly on two dimensional materials. And you know that it all started with the graphene in, in the beginning for the last decade or so, it's more on transition metal dichalcogenides. These are the advantages, these are the actually that visible light emitter or, or they, are, they could be direct band gap. So initially, you know, all the excitation was on graphene, but for photonic devices, probably the other materials, TMDCs we call, the black phosphorus works as a, in an in a infrared region, dichalcogenides mostly in the visual, visible region, and the boron nitride is an insulating material. In fact, boron nitride is coming very fast as a, a kind of single photon emitter, just using our experience of using that nitrogen vacancy and diamond. 
So these are also very high band gap materials. So you can easily create the uh, so called the nitrogen vacancy by using high temperature annealing. So it's going very fast. Just to review a little bit on these materials because not many people have talked on that. So most of the excited excitation in this field started from 2010 when the people could show the direct band gap optical transitions in a monolayer molybdenum sulfide because that is important for making a single photon emitter or LEDs. And uh, initially, most of the efforts were making kind of a transistors electronic devices. About seven, eight years back, it was more making on really photo detectors, solar cells, and the light emitters, but not necessarily they are single photon. For the last few years, it's more towards the making a single photon sources and detectors, because that is the backbone of a quantum photonic devices, either for quantum computing or quantum information. So, so I think this is also very, very potential in the last few years, making the moire excitons uh, that you can twist a bilayer 2D materials. The one of the advantages of the 2D materials, they are Van der Waals materials. And the advantage is that if you can make very, very high quality materials and they can be transferred on only any kind of substrate. Does not matter whether it's gallium arsenide or silicon or SOI. Okay, the physics is very, very rich. Uh, probably some of the people have already talked about but we are interested for quantum photonic devices because of this basically strong spin orbit coupling uh, splitting or band splitting. Okay, something is cut off here. And a modified Coulomb interactions in this case, which gives us to some kind of strong many body effects. So this many body effects is very, very essential for making the quantum uh, devices. So uh, just want to review for the last few years, what has been done already achieved. Particularly the advantage is that, see, in this case, as I said, you can easily mechanically exfoliate a monolayer 2D layers, which give you light emission in the direct band gap emissions. And you can put the gates like a normal fit. And the advantage is that they are very, very attractive for spin qubits, valley qubits, and uh, hybrid spin valley qubits. So in this case, what is happening that you are basically, you want to localize the excitons in the 2D materials. But normally 2D materials are supposed to be defect free if you have perfect 2D materials. So if you can create a kind of a defects, localized defects, like nitrogen vacancy in diamond, you can localize this 2D TMDC excitons, and then you can have all these kind of circuits probably possible, either arrays of qubits or simply for the quantum communications, because these are all emitting lasers or the LEDs. And as you know, the fiber optic technology is very, very matured. So we feel that quant uh, the photon-based sources or detectors are very attractive for particularly quantum communication technology. In addition, the biologists and the chemists, are, of course, they're very, very interested to the uh, so-called the single atom sensing or single molecule sensing, which can be done by the quantum sensors. And of course, you have got a lot of reach of fundamental physics involved in this case. Okay, some few, uh, this is not our results, of course. This is the few uh, slides I've given for the already, people have done already for the particularly, this particular system, the tungsten selenide called WSC2. And you see this is a monolayer TMD. You can make the gate by electron beam lithography. And what do you do? What, finally, what do you measure? This autocorrelation coefficient. How strong is autocorrelation coefficient, the G squared tau, at a zero delay? So as somebody was saying, this should be as short as possible. It should be as low bandwidth as possible. That is the ideal single, uh, single photon emitter. But as you know, the temperature always gives rise to some kind of broadening. So lower the temperature, better is the characteristics of the single photon emitter. But again, you have to, your aim is to do ultimately uh, demonstrate this quantum computer, which works at the probably at room temperature, if not possible, maybe liquid nitrogen temperature 77K. So that is, of course, far ahead. The greatest advantage of this kind of devices, these actually, as you see, this just by varying the number of layers or varying the gate voltage, you can tune the emission frequency. So that is one more important thing, for, particularly for any electronic devices for the uh, communications or computations. So this is another technique. It's not really the defects. It's a simply localized strain. And localized strain can be almost go to the atomic level if you use the atomic force microscopy tip on a, on a structure. So in this case, actually, that again, that WSC2 put in a hexagonal mirror nitrate substrate and put, the t, put your tip in. And since it can be done in any substrate, in this case, it was done polymer substrate. So you can easily create atomic strain or the molecular strain. 
and this strain give rise to kind of a, again a single photon emission as you see at two volt at the bias as low as two volt you get a strong correlation coefficient at the zero below time that is a signature of the single photon emitter uh, of course in our group uh, we are doing more on materials still on some devices but not on the scale of the making a kind of a qubits and uh, we started with a monolayer of tungsten sulfide so that is also very very attractive because it has got a very very strong spin orbit splitting and you can really detect the mini body effects at room temperature you don't have to go to the low temperature as well at all so as you see that the first signature that we get in this kind of materials is a kind of a quasi particle detection or emission so in this case the ws2 monolayer ws2 on a silicon dioxide substrate you get both the exciton which is denoted by the x and you get a negatively charged exciton which is called trions so these are all quasi particles and once you start optically pumping this what you are doing when you absorbing photon there are a lot of optical doping it's not a chemical doping it's called optical doping so that signature is very very clear as you see here that uh, you get a strong photoluminescence intensity and the peak of this intensity actually varies as a function of the optical doping so finally this is very very interesting because these are semiconductor but finally at some threshold optical doping is goes to a kind of a metallic transitions so how do you get this exciton resonant frequency as you increase the power density first there is a red shift the decrease in energy and that at certain power you get a blue shift so this red shift to blue shift crossover actually it happens which is called the mod transitions only happens when there is a competition between two different phenomena the first one the, you get the red shift due to the what is called the very very strong dielectric screening that gives to band gap renormalization which reduces the band gap but at high optical doping you have got a reduced exciton energy so that you have got increase on the band gap so overall this actually plays a role so that's what we have shown in our model unfortunately the paper not coming here the physical review materials so initially this is a normal pl emission then you get a red shift at a moderate optical doping when you go to strong optical doping is a phenomena called the pauli blocking effect that you can observe so that means it's a really quantum material that you can uh, do it now the aim is to finally put it confined in a cavity to get a emission from that the other very easy technique which is known in the semiconductor is basically that light matter interactions using a plasmonic material this is very very well studied so in this work this this particular group in the nature comp group had shown very nice idea so instead of afm tip that afm tip is not compatible for the device applications so put some metal layers metal nanoparticles is a gold tip and which you can make an array of the metal nanoparticles as you see on this single layer or mono layer ws2 layer ws2 layer sorry in this case and you can again create a single photon emitter and so you can again get a very very strong so called the g2 tau at a zero degree time and this can be done either by putting some kind of a plasmonic surface plasmon resonance which has got a strong interactions with your mono layer or the other thing which is compatible to kind of integration of a large area you create a kind of a vertical pliers and as you know that as i said that integration of these two d materials is very very useful and easy for any substrate whether it is a planar or whether it is a textured substrate so in this case put there is a vertical topography or the, the, there is a you create by the lithography and again you see the carrier funnels here in the low band gap region and you low energy region rather and you get as again a strong uh, single photon emission which is detected by this uh, g2 tau uh, kind of nature okay so what we did in our group in fact in fact we are trying to uh, i mean detect some some kind of a light matter interactions but with the quantum interference using the ultra fast spectroscopy so as you know that uh, there can be different kind of coupling between the plasmon nothing but metal nanoparticles and exciton in the 2d semiconductors which is very very strong so there can be weak coupling so this is very well known phenomena has been detected used by chemists and biologists for getting lot of sensing but what is important this two are kind of a little bit uh, very very difficult to implement in a solid state system i'll say so one is the fano resonance when it happens in case of intermediate couplings between the plasmons and excitons so what you have to do here you have to tune your exciton emission energy so that it 
weakly couples, intermediate couples with the, this is a plus bond band. The green one is the plus bond band and this one is the exciton energy. So then you get a asymmetric line step, which is known as the Fano line steps. So this is a very well known phenomenon, but how to detect it. The other thing is the strong coupling between the uh, two, uh, two discrete particles and or maybe the when the exactly the plus bond resonance as well as the excitons are very, very strongly coupled you get a kind of a quantum splitting, which is known as the Rabi splitting. So if you can detect this, you can create a new kind of quasi particles, which normally does not uh, exist. So I'll not go to the details. This is a very, very complicated experiment with a femtosecond pump probe spectroscopy. So only thing that I have to say for the technical people that we use the pump using a 405, nanobeam, uh, 405 nanometer pump laser, and the probe laser is a wide broadband, of course derived from the same source. So uh, this is conventional. The first slide is conventional. This has already been detected by, uh, I mean, demonstrated by many and you get, so what is I'm going to show here, in this case, we have got used molybdenum sulfide 2D layer. They're not bono layered, they're few layers. And you get the A exciton and B exciton and basically monitor their continued map. And what you did get, you do get, actually you get a lifetime of the excitons. Particularly in this case, we have monitored A excitons. And as you see for the plasmonic system, like the second one, gold MOS2, there's a very strong charge transfer. And that's why actually you have got the increase of the lifetime about 200 fold as compared to MOS2. So this normally happens, but just wanted to show, and if you can use for a normal classical photo detector, I will not say it's a quantum photo detector, but you see enhancement in the current voltage characteristics. And you see, of course, probably two or two to three orders of magnitude increase in the detection efficiency. But what is more interesting is this one, uh, that the funnel resonance as a quantum interference effect, as I said, which happens for a intermediate coupling. So if you have a plasmon absorption band of a gold nanoparticles like this, surface plasmon like this, and you have got MOS2 excitons, it is A exciton, this is a B excitons. If you can place them in between, you get this novel effect due to strong interactions between the exciton and plasmon, you should get this kind of asymmetric line set, what is called Fano line sets. Now, what is interesting here is very, very difficult to get a two Fano resonance peak in any solid state system, unless you have got a, a kind of a 2D material, because in this case, somehow the exciton energy of this actually, as you see in MOS2, it comes within the plasmon band. Then we detect it, by ultrafast spectroscopy because it's very difficult to detect them with a normal steady state luminescence. So what you do here, if you just a uh, little, little bit more technical here, this is the normal absorptions. If you are mapping in the real time as a function of the time delay. So when you go above some kind of a one picosecond or so, this phano asymmetry line steps comes and there are kind of two peaks, which can be very, very clearly seen in the, I mean, uh, magnified image here that delta tau more than one picosecond, we get a strong two final peaks. One comes due to the A excitons and one comes to the B excitons. And this is very, very stable. Okay, good. This is very, very stable. Is, in fact, we have done up to five nanoseconds. So that means you have made some kind of a uh, quantum interference using the phano. And the next one, that is also possible because the people are trying to make a, again, kind of a polariton laser which also works at room temperature. In the gallium arsenic system, people have demonstrated by using a kind of a quantum or heterostructures. So the idea is like that in this case, I'll not go into the details. You use a plasmon, you have the excitons, which are very, very strongly coupled. Now what happens in presence of a photon? So if you sign photon, this exciton plasmon polariton, or it is called the plexitons. So these new, new quasi particles, probably I will have heard this, this is a sample preparation, how do you do? Only important thing is this, in this case, that A excitons actually strongly interacts with one of the plasmon band and B, uh, B exciton actually with one of the other uh, bands. So that's why I choose two different particle size of the gold nanoparticles. Otherwise it's not possible. Then again, we do the so-called ultrafast measurements because it's very, very difficult to detect at room temperature. If you see the non-plasmonic one, this is normally for you are showing for the B excitons. And this is for the A excitons. So normally you are getting a single deep or single peak, depending upon your reflection spectra or transmission spectra. But as soon as you take a strong 
I mean, uh, uh, gold metal nanoparticles as the plasmon, you are getting the splitting of the peaks. So that is actually called the Rabi splitting. So Rabi splitting is the signature of formation of a the plexitons or polaritons, which is also clear from the contour map and the lifetime for both the cases we got about seven picoseconds or so. And this is the normal model that there has to be a energy anti-crossing behavior. And you have to measure that what is the zero detuning time at delta A equal to zero, what is the energy difference between the two. And then finally, I mean, just we model this using a two state quantum systems when it is or rather two discrete excitons with a continuum. And by using the simple harmonic oscillator model, we could find that what is called the, uh, sorry, it is not uh, seen here actually, the fitting results should uh, show that for the excitons about 269 MeV, for other one is 272 MeV. Only the point to note is that when you're talking about 270 MeV, it's much above the room temperature. So ideally, if these polaritons or this structure uh, uh, can be confined in a, uh, confined in a cavity structure, it is possible to get the polariton lasing and of course, getting the single photon is another kind of a, a challenge in that. Okay, so that is the summary of our work. And uh, yeah, these two are already completed the work. Shiroshi is working for our fifth year research. And I'll be very happy to say, uh, take some questions. Thank you so much. Any question from Korean side? There might be no questions from Korean side. Okay. Our, our own house. Okay. Thank you, Shamit. That's a very rigorous lecture. Just I want to know about the reliability and the repeatability of these observations because it's a very novel observations that you have done. See, the reliability always depends upon how, how, how good you could prepare the material, whether it's a defect free or the structure that you meet. Whether, if, the, if the structures are defect free, ideally this is very, very reliable because it's no other perturbation from the external environment, isn't exactly. it? No electric field, nothing else is a photon induced. Exactly. It's extremely reliable. In fact, that's what the photonic community thinks this is the way to get a quantum computer. Exactly. I mean, so I am talking on behalf of them right now. So in terms of uh, results, is there any study that uh, related to the defect density per micrometer square or per nanometer square? What is the tolerance level of the accuracy of these results? Yeah, this is a, uh, this is a good question. See, ultimately, uh, you have to characterize the devices. So what is the width that I talked about? If your defect is more, of course, you will not get a single photon. This will be broadened. Not only thermal broadening, there will be defect induced broadening. So that is unexpected. And the second is, of course, that what is the responsibility, whether really it detects a single photon. So what is the responsibility of uh, the detector? So it should be at least in the level of 10 to a 10 ampere per watt or so. Then probably you can say, and that all depends on how pure is the material. And the advantage of the 2D is that particularly mechanical exfoliations, you don't have any defects. But unfortunately, they're not scalable. So you have to go to the CVD. So system. in that case, if there is any defect, then what is the interference level tolerance? That if defect is there, still we can get the- If result. you can put one defect, absolutely okay. That localized defects will be acting as a trapping level. But if you put more defects, probably it will ruin your system. Yeah, well, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any question from anyone? Uh, so thank you very much, sir, for your nice lecture. Uh, actually, sir, uh, that uh, exciton plasma, uh, the interaction that dip, uh, that uh, drives different phenomena. So does it depend upon that uh, shape of that uh, gold nanoparticle? Yes, uh, do you think? Yes. Definitely. So, so is it possible to tune that shape or size or morphology of the particular nanoparticle, say gold nanoparticle, to observe different phenomena from in the fact, same heterostructure? Uh, in fact, absolutely possible. When you put, do this, uh, do by electron beam or ion beam lithography. So the okay. one the result I have shown is a simple self-assemble technique. So I didn't have much control. So that is not really, it's not really monodispersed. Okay. But you can, the advantage of this technology is that you can really make monodispersed by using top-down approach. 
Okay. So whether you want to make a spherical, triangular, that is one study that is going on because those people have got good facilities, they can afford to do that. Okay. So definitely yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. So oh. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, over to you. Definitely over to Korea. Yes, uh, now this is, uh, thank you, Professor Ray. And now is the, the last talk of today's session. And the talker presenter is uh, Professor Jun Seok Ho from the Department of Chemistry, Sangyongwan University will give us a talk on a chemistry application on quantum club subspace diagonalization aided by quantum power method. Okay, let's thanks to you. Hi everyone. Uh, thank uh, for the introduction and uh, the uh, thank uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me uh, to this uh, conference. Uh, so today I brought a story of uh, benzene, uh, which is uh, just a toy system for testing uh, uh, some quantum algorithms uh, for some NISC uh, devices. Um, so here uh, I. So we want to test uh, the algorithms for some uh, reasonably large molecular systems uh, uh, for the OLED uh, calculations. So, um, so we used uh, the, uh, the Kirillov subspace method as a, as a subroutine uh, with the quantum algorithms. And then the remaining uh, tasks are done by the classical uh, diagonalizations. So in, uh, the OLED applications, uh, probably you know that the, uh, the singular triplet uh, energy gap is a, uh, an, an important uh, the parameter for judging whether it would be useful for, um, for the OLED uh, function or not. So, but this is not, uh, not for the, uh, um, the OLED application itself, but we just want to test uh, whether we can use the Krilov subspace method for those kind of uh, application or not. Okay, um, so let me. Okay. All right. So, um, so probably you uh, heard about the VQE, the variational quantum eigen solver method, and we have that, but it has an, uh, the uh, shortcomings. Uh, it's a barium plateau uh, problems. So uh, if we have uh, the, the large system, then uh, the, the Hilbert space is really huge that we uh, often meet uh, some uh, uh, the stopped in the place uh, where uh, we cannot find uh, the information about the um, the minimum point, right? Local either local minimum or, or global minimum. So it we often meet the barren uh, plateau problem in variational eigen solver. Uh, so uh, here we ex uh, this part explains the uh, the concept of the expressibility and then trainability. So in the left hand side. So we have some uh, ansatz space here, and then we this uh, the uh, green and then the red are uh, the, the the problem uh, the Hilbert space. So if we have the uh, the the, the we, if we targeting the specific problem uh, with the ansatz, then we have uh, the uh, some uh, nicely curved uh, the the uh, the the uh, energy space. Uh, but if we have the um, the uh, but it, it, but this ansatz cannot express uh, the uh, the second problem. But if we have the the flexible ansatz, right? Then we can express the two problems. But uh, the, uh, the the curve, the potential energy curve, uh, becomes very shallow. In this case, this is a cost function. So we have to minimize it, but it is very hard to find this point. So we want to avoid this problem. So, um, so this, uh, this shows that the, uh, depending on the ansatz, the, uh, this is a gradient. 
uh, of the energy curves. And then depending on the ansatz, as we increase the, uh, the layers, that means if we increase the expressibilities, then it, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gradient, it's a vanishing. Okay. So we want to overcome the, uh, the problem with the Krilov subspace uh, diagonalization, which is a very uh, traditional method for, uh, uh, for uh, studying the exponentially large Hilbert space with a finite number of the basis sets. So we uh, have initially have the problem, for example, with the qubits. So we have, the, we have a, uh, n qubits, then we have a two to the n Hilbert space, then of course we cannot uh, diagonalize it uh, directly because it's exponentially large. So we want to uh, confine it to the, uh, uh, the polynomial number of uh, the dimension. Of course we lose the accuracy, but we hope that if we are uh, the clever enough to choose the uh, proper uh, basis set, then we uh, would be able to obtain the uh, good information about the low, uh, lowest uh, or, or lower uh, the eigenvalues of the problems. So we uh, select uh, some basis set uh, by selecting some operator A uh, based on the uh, uh, reference state. These are the reference states and then we select the uh, basis and then uh, which uh, means that the A shares the similar uh, eigenspace with the uh, original Hamiltonian. So we uh, Make the uh, the matrix elements based on this uh, the um, uh, the basis set, and then we solve the uh, generalized uh, eigenvalue problems so with this uh, finite uh, basis set. So the the what what quantum does here? Uh, so actually, so we calculate the uh, the matrix elements uh, with the quantum device. And then, of course, these uh, over integrals uh, with the quantum device because it uh, it uh, uses uh, the uh, exponentially large uh, uh, resources in in, uh, in classical device. So we can use it use the quantum device uh, to solve uh, to obtain those numbers uh, with the uh, the polynomial number of uh, quantum resources. So we construct this uh, the uh, generalized eigenvalue problem. Uh, then we can diagonalize this um, uh, Hamiltonian uh, uh, with the classical computer because it's a uh, it's a confined to the uh, the polynomial size of uh, basis set. Okay. So there are several uh, choices that we can choose uh, for the A. So these are the these are not only uh, the choices, but uh, the uh, the so these three are the popular choices. So one is a real-time propagator. So real-time propagator uh, case, uh, it's uh, easy to implement in the quantum device because it, this is a unitary gate, but it often meet the, uh, the linear dependency problem. And then we can avoid this uh, linear dependence problem with the imaginary time propagator. But uh, here we uh, are suffering from the normalization thing. And then uh, we, uh, so, so here we chose the, uh, the Hamiltonian itself. Uh, and then this is uh, called the quantum power method. So we just generate uh, the, the, uh, the moment operators uh, or with the uh, reference states. So we uh, basically, uh, we, uh, so our, our, uh, our, um, Observers are the H to the N. So we calculate the matrix elements uh, based on that uh, setups. So, uh, but here we need to uh, think about how to implement H to the power of N. So H to the N is not of definitely not um, uh, a unitary operator. So we have to approximate it as the, uh, the time derivative, the nth, nth derivative of the uh, propagator with the H. And, and then, so with this uh, setup, of course we cannot do it, uh, unfortunately, so uh, directly. And uh, so we approximate it as a finite difference method. So we uh, use this uh, set approximation and then 
the h to the power n becomes a linear combination over the unitaries. So uh, if we want to calculate this uh, operator, then we can just uh, calculate uh, the, uh, the polynomial number of uh, over integrals. Then we sum them up in the end. OK. So, um, so how we can obtain this over of integral? So we all used uh, the, uh, the Hadamada test, uh, which generates uh, the error in uh, the statistical error is one of epsilon square, uh, so epsilon. Then we need to sample uh, with the uh, one of epsilon square uh, scale. So this is a, a setup uh, for the over of integral. This is very straightforward method. Uh, in quantum information uh, theory. And so we used um, the PPP Hamiltonian, the uh, Paris Par Popper Hamiltonian for the benzene molecule, which considered only the pi electrons for the benzene molecules. And uh, so, yeah, so this is a semi empirical Hamiltonian uh, for the simplicity. So because uh, so we cannot really handle the all electrons uh, in benzene. So, but uh, what we want to have is a single and triple gap, uh, energy gap, but it it's, uh, generates a uh, quite good uh, result. Uh, uh, so it was reported, it's not our work, but it was uh, reported uh, that the, uh, the PPP Hamiltonian can generate those numbers quite well for the uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons. So we use uh, uh, this Hamiltonian. This uh, look quite similar to the, uh, uh, the, the Hubbard model but more complicated than that. So our goal is of uh, finding the first, uh, the single and triplet gap, uh, gap uh, of the benzene molecule. So uh, yeah, the Hamiltonian yeah, is quite uh, the symmetric. So uh, it requires to, uh, 12 qubits uh, actually. Uh, so uh, yeah, it has a six pi electrons and then we, we need to consider spin up and down. So it makes it 12. And then we have, we consider uh, by considering the symmetry. So we, uh, we can reduce it to the eight qubits. And then we uh, constructed, uh, we, we studied uh, the, the single reference and the multi-reference cases. So we select the reference states as a ground state. The, and then the first excited configurations like that for the single uh, reference state. So we use all this and then by increasing the, uh, the order of the, uh, the moment uh, operator, uh, the power operator uh, to construct the, uh, the, the, the total uh, Hamiltonian, so the confined Hamiltonian with the grid of subspace. And then we also uh, diagonalize it uh, with this uh, tri triplet reference state then we uh, subtract the lowest two numbers. Okay, so these are the results that the, um, so this is the, anima, uh, the energy uh, uh, minimization for the single ground state. And then uh, the, this is an error from the uh, exact uh, number. So we, uh, so we, uh, so this is this first line is a single reference case, but in this case um, uh, we don't see that much benefit of the multi reference because uh, so I think it, it depends on the system. So, but this uh, in the benzene case is uh, it doesn't affect that much. So, but it, of course the multi reference uh, but it costs more. But so so along this line it, we increase the, uh, the 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 power of power. So it, it's, it converges quite, quite fast with the power. But uh, if we go to the right and uh, right, right curves, and then there we increase the, uh, the, the reference uh, state number. But that effect, that uh, actually gives the, the slower uh, the convergence. So actually the, the single reference is uh, faster for the case of benzene. It's not a general, uh, we cannot generalize it for other, other cases. So we also found something similar for the triplet uh, ground state energy. And then, uh, yeah, so we, uh, so one of the benefit of the uh, Krilov uh, subspace uh, method is the comparing to the VT. So we can obtain the excited states also. So that's, that naturally gives us the uh, uh, excited states. So if we are interested in the excited states, 
uh, then uh, this would be a good uh, choice uh, for, for, for the study. Okay, so I already told you about the uh, linear dependency problems uh, of this, uh, uh, the, the real time. And then, uh, yeah, so, so uh, maybe I can just, um, yeah. So, uh, so here is a conclusion that is, so uh, by increasing N, the, 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 the order of power, and we, uh, it is, uh, which is difficult in the classical algorithms because it involves the, uh, the exponential number of the, um, the, the terms. So, uh, so it's, that's why it makes the uh, error converges faster than the increasing M. So that's our uh, just uh, preliminary conclusion. So, so we believe that the, the quantum uh, Quillock method, actually uh, it is called a quantum, uh, but it is uh, uh, same as the, uh, the classical Quillock method, but we just used a uh, quantum algorithm for evaluating the matrix elements. So, so the numerical procedure is exactly the same as the classical part. Yeah. So we believe that the, uh, the quantum clear log methods are uh, advantageous uh, than the classical one uh, uh, because uh, it's, it, it can make it happen for the large system. Uh, so that's what we believe. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we uh, we didn't consider yet the sampling error. So we so this is only the preliminary result, and then we are going to further uh, investigate it on this uh, way uh, for other systems, and then with some uh, more detailed studies. So these are the uh, the conclusions that we have. We demonstrated an application of quantum Quillock of subspace uh, based on the power method and uh, approximate the Hamiltonian of electrons in a free uh, benzene uh, molecule. And then, yeah, the singlet and triplet, so we could achieve uh, within our uh, approximation is a uh, uh, nano Hartree and then uh, micro Hartree uh, error. And in this case, the increasing clock order, so there's a power order, right? It's more important than uh, increasing the number of reference states, but this is cannot be generalized for other systems, but in the case of the benzene, it is like that. And comparing to the uh, multi-reference uh, case, then the uh, QPM-based Krilov method was advantageous in terms of the numerical stability and then the accuracy. Um, so it, uh, it potentially shows the general uh, uh, applicability of the midterm, uh, so the so NISC devices on the electronic structure problems, and then avoiding the problem of the VK, uh, such as uh, baron plateau and the measurement to uh, complexity. Okay, so this is all I have, and then I'm happy to take your question if you have any. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Professor Ho, for the nice presentations. Is there any questions or comments from India side first? And from India, please, uh, if you have some questions, please raise your hand and get the microphone, please. A question on, okay, if there is no question or comments from India side, is there some question or comments from Korean side? Okay, time is up. Okay, thank you for your, the Professor Ho for your presentations. Now, this is the end of today's workshop. And tomorrow we will come back with the theme of machine learning for the development of advanced materials. And thank you for uh, all of you for joining us today and we will see you tomorrow again. Okay, thank you. Thank you for participating in the conference and thank you for the presentations. And is there some final comments from Indian side? Uh, thank you, Professor Lee first, and then all the speakers, all the, all the eight speakers from the Indian and on the uh, Korean side. I think it was an excellent session and throughout the day. 
and we are all looking forward for interactive sessions, exciting session tomorrow. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Aside from India, so thank you all to be here today. Uh, two session chairs and our eight speakers today. Few from uh, in physical mode, few from online. So thank you all for for joining. And uh, tomorrow we'll be meeting again at our Indian time, 9.30, and Korean time, one o'clock. So we invite this Indian group to join to the lunch. And sorry, the Korean attendees, we cannot offer online <laughs> during lunchtime. Thank you. Okay, thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye.